tonight on Perch Exploitation. それから儲からない映画を作る監督だっていうのが向こうの、まあ、理由でした。それから儲からない映画を作る監督だっていうのが向こうの、まあ、理由でしたそこがやっぱりそのブラック映画の強みですよね何をやったって構わないって言いますかね面白くあれば何をやったって構わない、まあ、そういうのが、まあ、私の、まあ、文法って言いますかねやり方になったわけです。あのわからない映画、それから儲からない映画を作る監督だっていうのが向こうのまあ理由でした。Hello, everybody, and welcome to Branch Exploitation. My name is Nick Cheney, and with me is the American Drifter, Dan Jeremy Brooks. Dan, how are you? I am a hitman for Yakuza, and my name is Tetsu. Fighting in the snow with Osuka's assassin crew. I'm a Ronin more than wanderer. Do, 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 do. But when I'm whistling the theme, then there's Tokyo Drifter. Do, do, do. Is living the dream. Do, 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 do. And so on. <sighs> That was beautiful, as always.、Uh, Thank you. I know I know it, but what was that song? Oh, yeah, it's one of those melodies that、um, is so signature. It's,、uh, it's written by Jimmy Webb, who I think is one of the great songwriters of the pop era.、Uh, it's a, a Wichita lineman. Oh, yes. Okay. Yep, I、sense. am a lineman for the county. Yeah, it's、uh, really great tune. It is. I get it in my head all the time. <laughs> That's just the kind of fun we plan to have here tonight on Red Jack Exploitation.、Mm -hmm. So, if you couldn't have、uh, guessed already, we are going to talk about our first 
Yakuza film on Project Exploitation. Of course, Yakuza being the Japanese genre of uh, essentially gang-related crime uh, that was very prominent in the 60s and 70s and and beyond, too. But uh, they certainly had a heyday at at a certain point. Mm -hmm. And uh, the director of today's film was certainly no stranger to the genre. So today's film is Tokyo Drifter, directed by Seijun Suzuki. And it was released in 1966. So, typically, I will sometimes, you know, uh, get us acclimated to what we're talking about. But today, I'm going to hand it over to the very trusty hands of one Dan Jeremy Brooks, because he's the one who uh, brought this movie to the table. I had not actually seen it prior to this, even though I'd always been meaning to. Uh, I've literally had my Criterion copy for, like, years, but have not watched it. So Dan brought this to the table, and he has quite literally read the book on Suzuki. Uh, <laughs> so, Dan, let's talk Tokyo Drifter. All right. Well, you know, as you said, it is a Criterion. It's actually one of the first 50 Criterion DVDs they ever released. I think it's from, like, 98. It's number 39 or 38 or something like that. So early, early Criterion. So, And also, I do want to mention this. Um Mainly just to, you know, pat myself on the back or something, I guess. But on our main site for Project Exploitation, the groundhogs to the left and right of our logo are wreathed by these Dayglow graphic shapes. Those shapes I actually sampled from the original Criterion DVD artwork for Tokyo Drifter, like the inside and all that, the little blam blam stuff. And also there's Japanese lettering on both the breakout graphics and the saucer's rims that spell out the title. Well, at least on one of them. The other one, I'm not going to say what it is because we'll, we'll get to it eventually, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, yes, yeah, so super fun for me. So I guess what I should do first is just tell you the synopsis, and then we'll start talking about uh, the elusive pioneering maverick that was Seijun Suzuki. Yes. So. Uh, before you take your first breath of that synopsis, I will say something we've started doing here uh, on Project Exploitation as early as last episode is we've begun writing film synopses for the movies that we are doing because we found that a, it was requested of us, and B, the synopses that are found on the internet for most of these films are trash, and me and Dan are both very long-winded people, so <laughs> apologies in advance. So Dan wrote the synopsis for Tokyo Drifter. Dan, take it away. Thank you, thank you. So, <clears throat> plot synopsis. Tetsu the Phoenix is the most fiercely loyal of a retinue of guys who work for Kurata, who's a former Yakuza boss who has recently gone straight. Kurata's main sources of income are a nightclub and a building in downtown Tokyo, but the honest life has left him unable to pay the rest of the money he owes on it in a timely manner. Meanwhile, Tetsu, our main character, is being constantly harassed by the rival Atsuka gang into joining them, but Tetsu refuses. Through a combination of muscle and treachery, the Atsuka gang scams Kurata out of the deed to the building. In the process of this, a couple of innocent civilians are killed, and so a bargain between Kurata and Otsuka is struck, in which Kurata will get back the building, but with two catches. Otsuka will be allowed to rent parts of the building at a favorable price, and Tetsu must be, quote, eliminated from the picture. Tetsu decides to lam it, thus becoming the titular drifter, while Otsuka's assassins, including the similarly named Tetsu the Viper, pursue and repeatedly attempt to kill Tetsu in the increasingly southernmost parts of Japan. But during Tetsu's self-banishment, he keeps running into Kenji the Shooting Star, who used to work for the Otsuka clan, but works now as an independent. Kenji helps Tetsu out of several jams, but remains a mysterious figure. Eventually, Tetsu gets put up at the home of Umatani, an old Yakuza friend of Kurata. It turns out Kenji is staying there, too. And the three guys get some male bonding time in while breaking up an interminably long brawl at Umatani's Western Saloon. Back in Tokyo, Kurata has thrown his lot in with the evil Otsuka, and per their agreement, Kurata telephones Umatani to kill Tetsu. Umatani turns out to be a good guy who can bring himself to shoot Tetsu, who he's grown to like, and so he and Kenji break the bad news to Tetsu that he's been betrayed by his old boss. Tetsu angrily returns to Tokyo for a spectacular shootout in the old club, in which Tetsu vanquishes the lot of them with some pretty impressive gunplay and chin music. 
Kurata feels remorse for throwing over Tetsu and kills himself pseudo Bushido style. Tetsu's girlfriend, Shiharu, begs him to stay, but by that point, Tetsu has come to realize that he is a bird that must be free, and so he resumes his lifestyle of ceaseless drifting. Beautiful. Just Thank you. Beautiful. You know, I will say this about the act of writing a plot synopsis. Two things. One, mm. it is very hard. Like mm -hmm. to write essentially to retell a story that's obviously already been told, but to do it in a concise and informative way while also not being terribly dry, but also <laughs> to make sure you, you know, get the right points and all that, whatever. Right. It is extremely uh, rigorous in as far as like racking your brain as to like how to essentially talk about something that you could just watch instead of, you know, read or whatever. <laughs> um, but the other thing is it's a really good tool to actually engage with the, the, the movie. Like I found myself totally much more cognizant of like when I wrote the sex world one, like of everybody's names because I had to write them down. And, you know, I mean, it's, totally. it's, you know, obviously that's not really a mind blowing <laughs> realization, but until you like do it in practice, you're like, huh, maybe I should just do this for, Anything that I have to review because it, it reminds me a lot about things I miss. Anyway, but your, I thought, synopsis was wonderful. Well, thank you. And I, and I do agree with you. I think there is something about the process of kind of trying to summarize it and kind of hit all the major narrative beats that, well, I mean, not only, of course, makes you appreciate the structure of the films more, but... Also, yeah, I tend to remember the names more. I mean, there's definitely characters, you know, I wouldn't remember had I not had to kind of sit there and go, okay, now this guy, he's, how does he relate to this guy? You know, so yeah, I agree. It is kind of a fun little exercise. Um, and hopefully it's informed for the folks at home. So uh, Seijun Suzuki, I think, is probably one of the pivotal figures in um, the last like 50 years of film, 50 or 60 years, I guess you'd say. And... A lot of that has to do with the fact that he's incredibly influential, even though not a great many people have seen his films. I mean, they're, they're available. You can there's like eight or ten of them now. I think that you can see they're on Criterion or Arrow. But for the most part, he's he, he, he's more felt in how he's influenced others who have become uh, much more prominence you know so i mean there's there's obvious ones like jarmusch tarantino but there's a lot of other guys too it's it's he's just such an intriguing guy and his story is so interesting so i'm going to tell you a little about him but in order to talk about him i first got to tell you a little bit about uh nikatsu which was the uh studio that he worked for and the kinds of b movies they produced there so in a way you could almost draw a comparison between uh post-war nikatsu and post-war columbia pictures so you don't know, see episode nine about the big heat for more on that but by that i mean nikatsu in the 50s and 60s made various cheap genre pictures which sometimes they would call program pictures and you'd have like yakuza or gangster films uh comical detective films romantic melodramas war films and teen or often more like juvenile delinquent films. And they also traded in pink movies, sometimes known as Roman porn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll be talking about those shortly. Uh, yes. Not shortly in this episode, but shortly uh, in the grand scheme of things. Well, I, I do want to touch on it a little, and I know you are a fan, and I have definitely wanted to watch more of them, so I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to maybe doing some episodes on that. In a nutshell, uh, one critic who's a bit of a Suzuki expert or enthusiast, whatever you want to say, David Shute, he, he calls uh, the pink movies a mutated softcore subspecies of sex flick in which gushing blood served as a cinematic substitute for the band orgasm. The underlying sex repression in Japanese culture produced those climaxes of blood in Nikatsu's Irreductions. So it's like productions, but erotic, you know. So Suzuki was a contract director at, at Nikatsu in the 50s and 60s. And he was mostly assigned these uh, Soemono uh, Eiga, I think was what they were called. Yeah. Soemono Eiga. Yeah. Which is, means accompanying films, which is also another way of saying B pictures, uh, which I think in Japanese they would say like Iso Ide Eiga, <laughs> something like that. Eiga. That's, that's like film. Anyway, doesn't matter. Uh, and these things were supposed to come in at about a third to two thirds of the cost of the A picture it was going to be paired with. 
And these things were such quickies that they they usually released the, the release date for the film before they had even begun shooting the B picture. Like it was that much of an afterthought for Nikatsu. And Suzuki later said Nikatsu generally didn't care what the finished film looked like so long as it was an action film and it was produced under budget and it was released on time. Uh, they were production line quickies. You know, at, at the height of Nikatsu's productivity, they were releasing two movies a week. And so by the time Suzuki was like 45 or just shy, 45 years old, he had directed 40 movies. I mean, damn, that's incredible. So now the reason I mentioned all this about Nikatsu is because uh, Nikatsu, after the fact, they tried to sort of retcon their history and they tried to pretend that they were this quality company in when in fact they were just making shitloads of exploitation films so i just wanted to get that out of the way so you have that in the back of your mind when i tell you about this and the thing is when you talk about seijin suzuki you, you, you have to talk about this event that happened to him and it changed the face of japanese cinema and in a way it's still one of the great stories of uh, you know, of uh, what you might call like man versus studio. <laughs> you know, it's like it, 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 it feels almost impossible or maybe at least absurd to talk about Seijun Suzuki without touching on something that became known in Japan as the Seijun Suzuki problem or sometimes translated as instead of problem as uh, incident. But it's one of those classic stories. It's like it'd be like, um, I don't know you appreciate this, Nick. It's like talking about Wilco's uh, Yankee Hotel Foxtrot, you know, yeah. without talking about Reprise Records, you know, their negative reaction yeah. and how they wanted to bury the thing, you know, or like talking about Brazil, you know, Terry Gilliam's Brazil without mentioning all the protracted arguments between them and Universal over the budget and recutting the ending and getting it released and all that. It's just one of those stories that you, you, if you're talking about Suzuki, you have to talk about this. So. Okay, in a nutshell, what happens is in April of 1968, Nikatsu had had it basically with what they perceived was Suzuki's intentionally weird and increasingly, quote, difficult filmmaking style. So the company president, uh, Kayusaki Hori, fired him. And Hori's reasoning, as he was later very famously quoted, and you can still find this quote all over the place, uh, it was this sort of weird-ass tone poem. It was almost like a telegram. He says... His his reasons for firing Suzuki were Suzuki makes incomprehensible films. Suzuki does not follow the company's orders. Suzuki's films are unprofitable and it costs 60 million yen to make one. Suzuki can no longer make films anywhere. He should quit. Suzuki should open a noodle shop or something instead. <laughs> so Suzuki slept with my wife. Exactly. Yes. I mean, it's just so wow. You know, I, I yeah, just amazing. So Suzuki, <laughs> Suzuki sued them for breach of contract <laughs> and he ultimately won his case for wrongful, you know, dismissal and, and he, and he got the money. But even after that, he couldn't work anywhere until 1977. So basically nine years, uh, because the, what they called the big five studios in Japan, they basically all colluded. He directed a lot of like commercials and he wrote some essays and some books and stuff. And that was basically how he made his money. So basically what happened was pretty quickly, a huge chunk of the Japanese film industry or well, film community, I should say, it's not necessarily the industry, uh, formed an oppositional group about this. And they were staging protests and they were holding panels discussing uh, what was called the Seijun Suzuki problem or the Seijun Suzuki incident in order to raise national awareness and kind of put pressure on the legal system in, in, when he was in the process of suing them. So, but the people involved in it, it really ran the gamut. You have people like um, Oshima, which I know you're a fan um, and I am too. Yeah. He's one of my favorites. Oh yeah. I mean, uh, Shinoda was another, uh, but you'd have cinematographers and screenwriters and journalists and critics and artists in other disciplines like painting and uh, just average moviegoers. And, uh, you know, a lot of these people hadn't even seen one Suzuki flick. They didn't know anything, but it was just the treatment of him galvanized the Japanese film community. It, well, and the other reason too, that made it so odious was that um, Nikatsu just, I guess, apparently just to, I don't know if just the president was just trying to be especially, you know, petty or what, but they 
pulled all of Suzuki's films from distribution, which was a serious problem. And it really put this place called the Cine Club Research Society in a lurch because they were planning on showing a huge retrospective of Suzuki stuff like just a couple days from then. <laughs> so they're like, why did you pull all this? And so it was like it was almost just like this additional just little kick in the in the crotch in a way to Suzuki. So the main points of contention from the, the protesters, uh, there was one is, you know, the right of a filmmaker to have some measure of creative freedom within the job they've been hired to do. Uh, two is the right of a filmmaker to have the terms of his contract abided by or be compensated accordingly. And then the third one is the interesting one is the right of the public to have access to films. And Nick, this might be a little more. This might be too big a subject to get into very deeply right now. But one of the things that the Japanese film community kind of ended up asserting they kind of came to this idea was that a film that is released to the public instantly becomes the cultural property of everyone. Like the uh, Directors Guild of Japan, which was the big union for directors in Japan, basically said that a released movie ceases to be the exclusive property of a studio. And I mean, they still own the copyright and all that, but they no longer have the right to intentionally remove access to a film later on. And that's a really fascinating point, especially when I think about people like, I mean, even Steven Spielberg, who I admire greatly, but I mean, him kind of messing with his movies sometimes after like E.T. And people are like, well, it's his movie. And I'm like, yeah, but is it anymore? I, I've often thought that at this point, it, it seems wrong to me. I mean, he can mess with his movies however he wants, but it seems wrong for him to remove access to the original versions, too. That feels like overkill and just it doesn't seem like he should have that right in a sense. I mean, I know legally he does, but I, on a philosophical, artistic level. I completely agree. And I won't, you know, open that can of worms for today, but I, I will say that I'm <laughs> I'm in complete agreement. And frankly, you know. Even to to even do that, like to like you mentioned, Spielberg is essentially still a display of privilege because mm -hmm. there's so many filmmakers that can't do that, you know, yeah. who probably want to do that, and so it says a lot that only really George Lucas, Spielberg, you know, um, Michael Mann or whatever are even in a <laughs> yeah. position to be able to do that to to have as, that much influence where they can essentially not just make a new version, but try to quite literally replace the old version with this revised history. And that's not even getting into what the ramifications of that could be when it comes down to maybe like offensive things. Totally. We're one step away from saying, you know what, that joke is a little off color in this mm -hmm. movie. Can we film another line where, you know, mm -hmm. uh, not film, but like ADR or something, you know, where we, he doesn't say that word anymore or whatever, because then we're just messing with uh, cultural context and whatnot so I, I'm, I'm in complete agreement and i would definitely if that's a conversation i would love to have right i mean yeah there's so much we could say about that and i think this is part of what really galvanized the film community in japan was there's a, the other really big subtext here is who decides what's normal art you know what who i mean who watches the watchmen exactly yeah who decides who decides to watch who watches the people who watch The Watchmen, you know, I'm just saying. Anyway, <clears throat> but since the end of World War II, there was the big five studios, you know, and they had practiced a very much like a top down kind of approach in which they were they, they very much dictated what kind of cultural products were made and released. You know, I mean, I know everybody does that to an extent, but they were used to telling moviegoers what they liked and what they wanted to see. <laughs> You're going to get this because this is all there is. And so also the the big five effectively declared they didn't just say that the largest majority of film goers were the de facto choosers of what's mainstream and normal but they also basically said that it's going to be the lowest common denominator you know the bottom of the intellectual barrel and that's where the normie bar is so the the denouement of the story is at the end of 1968 which is the year Suzuki got fired the president uh, Hori gave an address to, I guess it was like the New Year's or maybe the Christmas address to the to the company. I don't know if he did this every year, but he was exhorting all the directors in the stable to make, quote, comprehensible films that appeal to the masses while simultaneously 
He's laying off a great many of the people, the employees, and he's drastically slashing the budgets of their upcoming film productions. And it's like, okay, well, you're sending some mixed messages here. And so then by 19, it seems like nine, mid 1971, Nikatsu was just dead in the water. And then by November, its business model had switched. It was exclusively producing porn now. So basically, amongst, uh, you know, modern film historians, the theory is, is that Nikatsu and President Hori were trying to pin the blame on Suzuki and others for the company's clearly inevitable insolvency. So, I mean, in my opinion, that sounded like they traded up. Well, see, and that's that's what makes it so rich. Is they're like, oh, Nikatsu, because they were they were technically the oldest movie company in Japan. I think they started in like 1895 for stage production stuff. I don't know. So they had like, oh, it's a rich tradition, always with dignity. And it's like, yeah, dude, come on, man. <laughs> you you were making genre quickies, and you didn't even give a shit what they were, basically. So oh, yeah. So it's it, two you know. things. One, I was going to ask you a question. Um, you mentioned uh, Suzuki was fired in '68, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, Tokyo Drifter was Tokyo. Right. Okay. So that movie was already released and completed. Right. Okay. But Nikatsu was not having it. They were like, they kept warning him, they're like, okay, you need to tone this down. And so then they got to Tokyo Drifter and they're like, God damn it, this is what we are talking about. We are going to punish you so hard. Your next film, you're going to have to shoot in black and white. How about that? So he makes this incredible movie, Branded to Kill. Oh, yeah. Which they think is crap. And so they release it in uh, June, you know, which is like apparently the dead time for movies. And I mean, it's basically you're just throwing it away. And they fired him. And he's like, man, I was doing you guys a favor. You needed a B movie. I wrote a script really fast with my friends. We put it together. You never cared what it was about before, <laughs> you know? So basically, in a way, he, he, yeah, they were trying to scapegoat him, uh, for, for their own mismanagement. Those jerks. I know, right? Yeah. Uh, I actually would love to hear your, your thoughts, your initial thoughts. Cause I mean, you just saw this, uh, fairly recently. Yes. I did. Yeah. This was the first Suzuki film I've ever seen. And, mm. uh, yeah, so I, this was my first time watching Tokyo Drifter, and I actually watched it twice in the last week, just nice. to really marinate in it. <laughs> um, there was, I mean, to put it bluntly, there was a lot of things that I liked. I thought it was pretty fantastic in general. So uh, overall, I was extremely pleased with it. I've seen quite a few uh like Japanese cinema, particularly from this era, is actually something I've seen quite a bit of, despite right. some of my blind spots, like Suzuki, because um, I've seen a lot of like Oshima films, and I've seen a lot of uh, Roman pornos, mm -hmm. or um, even some of the samurai films, like the Zadoichi films, or Lone Wolf and Cub, and that kind of stuff. You've uh, uh, just to interrupt for a second. Yeah. You've seen like all the Zadoichi films, haven't you? Or like pretty close. Uh, I, I own the whole collection, but I have not watched them all yet. Mm. I think I've seen like a third of them, like the first ten or so, and I love them. I'm just slowly. It's like every time I get in the mood to watch one, I still have another one left. You know, like I'm just savoring it. Totally, um, no, I get it, and they're fantastic. I totally recommend those. Mm. Um, so Suzuki and Tokyo Drifter, I was very much, I think, primed to like, but I've always heard that he can be somewhat. Not incomprehensible, but maybe esoteric to a fault. And I say to a fault from some people's perspectives, not uh, objectively speaking. And I got to say, I very much, very much enjoyed it. I, I'm glad I watched it twice because I wouldn't say I was lukewarm the first time, but I was definitely like trying to simmer on it and comprehend what happened, even if that's kind of beside the point. <laughs> um like, you know, the fact that some of the characters have extremely similar names yeah. and the fact that there are two uh, gals who are very similar to the point where for the first 20 minutes, I thought they were the same character for some reason. Like, they're like, you know, that was her night job versus her day job like that. Because <laughs> I wouldn't have put it past Suzuki to do something random like that. Um, and maybe because I was just expecting the movie to be, quote unquote, weirder than it you know, is because I actually find it to be a lot more straightforward than I was expecting in a good way. And I think what the thing it reminded me the most of, which is you might laugh at it, which is totally understandable, but is he kind of reminded me of a much more um, immediately talented version of like Jess Franco, where like mm. the way he gets through his plotting is just almost 
it, it seems incomprehensible, but in reality, it's mostly it's just because it's extremely matter of fact, and you know, <laughs> like um, there's there's not a an attempt to try to sell the story as there is to sell the mood and the uh, atmosphere, and obviously they are completely different uh, auteurs when it comes to visual styles and and productions and whatnot. I'm not trying to say that Franco is like Suzuki because a lot of people that would probably be blasphemous, but I think. <laughs> There's a similar approach there to, um, you know, to, to, to plotting, uh, at least in particular, um, because I found myself making it more complicated than it was. I was like, no, wait, all it is is this, this guy is, you know, beholden to that guy and that guy, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, <laughs> right. Um, totally. But I was kind of tickled by that. Uh I thought the production design obviously was a huge standout. I mean, every single space in this movie, I thought was a set in and of itself that I would watch a whole chamber piece, you know, take place. And I mean, I really liked, considering it was so starkly different than like the club. um, I really liked Karada's like den, you know, like the place where he lives because it kind of exists in its own vacuum where I'm almost confused as to what the entire, because you don't really see much other than just the single room. So I'm like, how does this room fit inside of like a large, (laughs) you know, habitable space? But you know what? I don't care because this just looks really cool, especially from the wide angle lens that's almost always used in most of these, uh, uh, you know, interior shots. True. And there were so many things like that from the club's ever changing color scheme, which is so brilliant because I love how it's essentially, you know, lights on the shining on the wall, not lights on the wall, but lights, you know, shining uh, onto the white wall. So therefore there's almost this ethereal quality to the club where you can kind of change the shape of the space based on the color, which is almost like an abstract, notion that makes it sound like I just smoked a joint uh, before I did this episode. <laughs> but I think there's something to it in the way that, you know, it, it, that the club scenes are framed where, you know, simply changing the hue of those light bulbs honestly made that entire club seem like it could be a completely uh, different time and space, you know, each time we return to it. And I, I found that quality to be very, very bewitching uh, beyond just saying like, oh, that looks cool or, you know, whatever. And I love even, like, the fact that, like, when um, uh, Tetsu is, like, uh, stranded in the, when they lock him up in the room, and when he breaks out, and even the pipes have colorful characteristics, you know. (laughs) I'm so glad you mentioned that. (laughs) The fucking sewage of the place uh, has, you know, this kind of color coordination that, you know, puts other movies' regular sets to shame, you know. So um, I'll, I'll say that story-wise, I, I really found it affecting the second time through. It's not that I didn't the first time through, but the first time through, I'm just trying to absorb what it is and what they're even going for. Um, and the second time through, I really felt pretty hard for tetsu's journey i mean Mm. he like you said in the first line of your synopsis he's just a fiercely loyal person to the point that like you know it says a lot about him as a character that the the thing we're introduced to him is him literally getting a beating for uh, on behalf of his boss who essentially has denounced what they're both good at, you know, yeah. which is being a crime boss. And so the fact that the first thing we're introduced to of him is essentially being so submissive to the point that he will, you know, get the shit kicked out of him because his boss has said, you know, we are no longer fight. We no longer do these. Um, it, it really brings into a stark contrast as to where the movie is going to end up because of where that loyalty takes him and how tenuous that loyalty was not on his behalf, but on unfortunately the behalf of his, uh, his former boss by the end of the movie. But um, yeah, I thought there was a million things that were great about this. You know, um, I thought the, the acting was pretty great. Like it didn't have that, like sometimes, and I kind of enjoy these, but sometimes uh, some of these, movies from this era and in the Yakuza like has like kind of histrionics, you know, like where people are shouting for no reason, but Mm -hmm. here it was actually pretty subdued to the point where I'm like, there's really nothing all that quirky about this. Not that I thought Suzuki was like 
we or something like that. But from the outside looking in, you, there's almost the opportunity to mistake him for being uh, just a, a director who only has affectations. But that's really not the case. There's there's always a heart, that we, well, at least from just the viewing of Tokyo Drifter, at least. It seems like there's always like a beating heart at the center of his movies that are not at all hard to find. Yes. It's just that other stuff is so garish, but so wonderful and absolutely essential to the Suzuki experience. So, <laughs> yeah, um, I got a lot uh, I could definitely say, but uh, Dan, what do you uh, think about Tokyo Drifter in particular? Well, I'm just going to respond to everything you said, because, uh, uh, and I'm so glad you liked it, by the way, because this is one of those movies I feel very passionate about. Um, uh, but I mean, I think you're, well, one thing you're, you're saying about the acting is so true. And Japanese cinema, uh, particularly, you know, prior to, say, like, you know, Oshima and Imamura uh, in the 60s and 70s, and even then, to an extent, there's a very, it's a very big style of acting. It's a very theatrical style. And I mean, my favorite director of all time is Akira Kurosawa. So obviously I love his films. And, and even then, at the beginning of my journey through Kurosawa's work, I was often taken aback by how big some of these performances were. Um, but I, I've, I've realized it's part of a larger tradition and it's actually somewhat realistic at times i mean there's certain it, it, uh, f f the little i understand about the japanese language is it's not just uh the words you're saying but the well obviously the accenting but also just the level of sometimes it seems like almost volume you know what i mean like certain things have to be said at a certain volume or the the, the meaning just doesn't exist now, now i could be just uh misinterpreting or totally simplifying something that's i'm sure really complex but yeah i know what you mean and, and this one doesn't have that it's a very cool very detached well that's what's funny it's 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 what's detached for them is kind of feels right at home uh, at least on our shores as far as like not to say we don't have angry people or we don't have loud or whatever <laughs> sure but it's when i was watching it i'm like you know it's like what, what you just said it's 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 got this cool detached demeanor but it almost gets i wouldn't say lost in translation but it gets morphed into translation because our example of detached is even further detached probably because we as a culture are already too disaffected with a lot of things mm. that we should be more attached but anyway <laughs> well no that's a good point i mean you can make a really strong connection here between them um, say like uh toshiro mafune's performance in yojimbo right and then you take the italian remake uh of uh which is fistful of dollars with clint eastwood and i mean you know it, mafune is very big i mean he he definitely has a uh, there's a brooding intellectual quality to his character, but he does get big sometimes when he needs to. And with Clint Eastwood, it's like, man, barely says a word in that movie, which is very effective for that movie. So you can kind of see the two, the two styles, the, the Western and the, uh, and the, well, at least Japanese. I can't speak for all of the East, but, but yeah, I, I apparently what Suzuki said was, um, well, the guy, the lead in it, I can't remember his name, but he was a singer and he had this song, Tokyo Drifter, that was really popular. And so they decided, hey, let's make a movie around it. And so they cast him. It was just sometimes what they would do. They would take kind of a, a pop star, matinee idol, young person, kind of try to run them as a star, sort of like the old studio system in Hollywood. So his name is actually Tetsu, by the way, in real life. Oh, that's right. Which, again, I mean, they wrote the script around him, so it makes perfect sense, you know? that's I forgot about that. So it's kind of like an... Like an Elvis picture in that sense, you know, like where yeah, that was very popular at that same exact time for the most part. In here, we're like, oh, let's bring this icon in and let's make a bunch of movies and and and, and play it to their strengths. Oh, totally, totally. And I mean, it would be like Elvis movies if he only did like one. Or I think he might have done a couple more, but this was his only like big starring vehicle. And partly that had to do with the fact that Suzuki said like you had to like prod the guy to get him to even say his lines. You know, it was like he, he's right off screen. He's like, Psst, act, act. You're supposed to act right now. So he was not Suzuki's favorite leading man to work with, but I mean, he, he does a good enough job. He just has to be cool, collected and, and underplay. And he typically does that. But um, anyway, I do want to say, I'm really glad you mentioned the thing about the, I guess it's Otsuka's basement or whatever, where he gets, you know, he falls through the trap door <laughs> and it's like, I mean, that cartoon iron door that he goes through to escape. It's like, I, I mean, it's like a vertical manhole and it's perfectly 
you know, color coordinated. Oh, and, and boy, lucky that he had that, that uh, crowbar just sitting right there. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I mean, there's just, you can see at this point, Suzuki's done so many movies that he's starting to be like, dude, do you guys even give a shit if it makes sense? And I, I think what you said about loyalty is, is, is intriguing because that's like very much the centerpiece to not just all of the Yakuza films made prior to this one, but very much Japanese art going back hundreds of years. Um, there's this idea of uh, a giri, which is social obligation versus like your personal feelings. And that's Ninjo. And so um, Tom Vick, who wrote a really great book on Suzuki that I'm reading right now, he says the drama inherent in these conflicting forces is the backbone of the traditional Japanese drama. So it's the tension between a gangster slash samurai's loyalty to his clan and versus his desire to lead a clean life in a way. And that was true in uh, Nikatsu's action films, which they called borderless films because they weren't supposed to take place in any particular time or place. And, you know, there's a lot of mixing of different uh, uh, eras. Like, you know what I mean? It's it's almost like Tim Burton's Batman. Feels very anachronistic. Very much so. Yeah. It, which is great, you know, but basically after World War II, Japanese filmmakers and artists started to kind of question the importance of honor and loyalty, uh, you know, the Bushido code. Because basically they saw the way that the imperial Japanese government used it to create propaganda that sent, you know, hundreds of thousands of them to their death. So they're kind of grappling with, well, the old ways, I don't know, they can be corrupted pretty easily. So should we just blindly accept them? But on the other hand, they're also kind of dealing with the limits of, you know, ooh, free spirited U.S. style individualism. And I, I think Suzuki doesn't find much meaning in either one. He was actually a veteran in World War II, and he survived the sinking of uh, the ship he was on twice. And, uh, well, more on that another time. I could talk about his war experiences and what he says about that some other time. But I think the even in the Nakatsu films before Tokyo Drifter, the, the Yakuza films they did, you're already seeing that tension between, you know, the Giri and Ninjo kind of breaking down because in the old ones it would be like well death or ritual suicide <laughs> you know like I mean, harikiri or something like you know like that film oh yeah uh which i mean i know you're a fan i can you got that poster right behind you there <laughs> uh which i do love that film too but it's it, the the younger generation the oshimas and and to an extent the suzuki's the guys who were basically young men who went off to war and, and somehow survived by the skin of their teeth they, they well like i said they weren't buying the usual bushido code and so it's like even at Nikatsu, where they were churning out these genre pictures that were very cookie cutter, even they had stopped kind of doing the the whole death ritual suicide ending. It ended up becoming that the Yakuza hero, there was like a third way where he would just go out never endingly wandering. <laughs> and I wonder, in a sense, if that's maybe individualism of the American kind kind of starting to creep into the Japanese art, perhaps, you know, as a, a byproduct of this American force fed globalism and capitalism that they were, I mean, they went from this one culture to suddenly having this new thing forced on them. And I think that's part of what makes Tokyo Drifter so bold is that Suzuki is kind of saying that Yakuza gangs and corporations are almost indistinguishable. And that's pretty bold writing. Um, like they, the screenplays by, um, uh, Yasunori Kawachi, I'm not I'm butchering that, but it's often described as like a fairly conventional genre piece. But I, now again, this might have been Suzuki's contributions later because he would he was heavily involved in rewriting the script. They said he would be up all night rewriting every night, you know, so he didn't apparently sleep almost ever. But so this could be Suzuki, uh, his point of view. But that's that's a pretty that's a pretty gutsy screenplay to have it where you say. You know, you're questioning the Bushido culture of like total unthinking fealty to your, you know, quote, betters. You know what I mean? That's pretty outside the box, I think. And then when you you combine that with the fact that the Yakuza uh, in this act quite a bit like corporate uh, bad actors, if you will, it's pretty iconoclastic, man. I mean, I, you know, I, basically Suzuki saying the fish rots from the head, you know, uh, it's the corruption is, is at the top. And 
again, I think it has to do with the fact that he was rejecting both the old pre-World War II duty, honor, sacrifice, Bushido stuff. And he was also kind of rejecting the American stuff, which seemed very exciting on the surface, but it was very um, spiritually empty, which I think people even now experience that in, in, in this country. And, and actually, the other thing that's interesting is that the whole Yakuza Corporation thing actually makes perfect sense the more I thought about it. Oh, for one thing, uh, Kurosawa's got a great movie called The Bad Sleep Well, which was done just a couple years before this. And it's a revenge story, a little bit like Hamlet, but it's all about the most evil guys. And they're all the people who work at this corporation. <laughs> so it's, it, it, I mean, it really, that kind of hammered it home and then this one goes like even one better and it kind of makes sense because and I, I don't know if you and I talked about this before, but so many of the old Japanese companies, they go back a ways. Some of them go back hundreds of years and they go back to uh clans. And so the families, you know, like extended families, the feudal clans basically the a lot of a great many of them transitioned into corporations and companies in the 20th century um and it's sometimes they call it uh zaibatsu but i mean i'm talking like companies like uh, mitsubishi you know kawasaki uh fuyo which owns uh canon and hitachi and that and then you got like um nissan and suzuki which i'm sure in some tangential way seijin suzuki is uh you know uh, related to them in some way and you know, uh, there's a Sumitomo. I think they own Mazda. You know, but it's just, it's like all this kind of clannishness, which lends itself to to Yakuza gangs, also seems to lend itself to corporations. And the Yakuza methods and the, uh, the predatory capitalists, the methods start to look pretty disturbingly similar. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, yeah, the answer to any perceived or proposed change is always, but this is how it's always been. <laughs> yes, you know, yes. with with incredulity, uh, and it's always you know whenever you watch any kind of these stories, you're always usually watching a character who um, is either questioning his loyalty to that, or in this case, is actually so fiercely loyal that he gets burned by the fact that it actually doesn't work as advertised. You know what I mean? Like that makes you just as much of a victim uh, because these things are meaningless if. The people at the top do not actually honor them. And if they're beholden to human beings, then it means that they can be broken at any time. And therefore, mm. none of this should be uh, taken as gospel. Right. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's even a part, the part near the beginning where Otsuka, who's, you know, the main villain, the main boss, um, he's kind of pining for that building, you know, and he's like, He's talking to one of his guys and he's like, ah, so we can take it legally, you know, which means basically to him, corporate theft and Yakuza theft are pretty much interchangeable because in, in, in neither case is justice or fairness play into it. I mean, yeah, the gangs even call themselves syndicates, which actually in, in, in the U.S. in the 20s and 30s, you would see that, too. Um, but I, I just think it's interesting to such a corporate word being used to describe a, a gang. And in a way, I was kind of reminded of a most violent year, actually, which you and I have discussed in, in, in great depth in the last couple of months. Very, I think, very enriching conversations. And there's a part in it where uh, Alessandro Nivola, his character's named Peter. And basically what he says is he understands why some business people choose to go about things in a corrupt manner. He says, he's talking about his dad, who was very corrupt and is now in jail. And he's basically tried to take over the company and, and run it mostly clean. But he says, I understand why he did what he did because it's easier, <laughs> you know, and, and you see that it is easier to just send over your thugs and rough up the guy who you owe money to, you know? And, and I mean, there's several times where I think it's the his name Yakamoto might be his name. He's, he's one of uh, Kurata's uh, guys. He's like, you sure I don't want to send over somebody? He's like, nah, nah, we can't do that. It's it's interesting. You can see how, yeah, I could see how attractive and, and, and easy e – that's easier money that way. And so it's – so when you see like Otsuka, he says at one point to uh, Kurata, he says, oh, money and power rule now. Honor means nothing. And it, it's funny because Tetsu um, really, really violently disapproves of Kenji, the shooting star, if you will, because he doesn't see him as – like sufficiently loyal to his past employers. And this is like a part where he says to Kenji, let's see, I got the quote here. Uh, you lost your sense of honor. And Kenji replies, Hey, is that such a bad thing? 
you know, which is an interesting point because if Kenji, and I'm sure you were thinking about this too, if Kenji had remained loyal to his sense of Yakuza honor and held those tenets above everything else, he wouldn't have worn Tetsu. Yeah. So it's like, what's the use of a code if it, if it forces you to do immoral things? So it's a, again, it's a lot like that Girian ninja where you want to be loyal to the clan, but you also don't want to do something that breaks your, your personal morality or your ethics. And, you know, after Tetsu learns of Kurata's betrayal, you know, we see that his loyalty, like you said, was misplaced. And it's almost like, well, it's possibly even pointless. I mean, I, 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 and this is sort of how I see it is uh, unless you have one views, one believes that um, an honor code is something you really do for yourself. It's like a gift you give yourself, not for your boss or anyone else. So in that sense, I see Suzuki talking about these characters where he's very iconoclastic. Like I said, he's, he's, you know, he's kind of uh, throwing over the corporations and the Yakuza, which, you know, again, either one of those was a pretty, pretty big sacred cow, but he, so he's iconoclastic, but he's not amoral. You know what I mean? Despite the fact that he would say he was, he's like, oh, I'm just making movies. I'm just a craftsman. I'm just trying to make them interesting. But I do think there's a moral vision that develops in his stuff in the same way that other guys who were auteurs, like in the U.S., he had like, you know, like Robert Eldritch and um, Don Siegel, and Nicholas Ray, and, and, you know, like Fritz Lang when he was in the U.S. and uh, Anthony Mann, some of those guys. It's like, despite the fact that they were just basically handed scripts, um, you know, by the studios and they had no no choice for the most part, they somehow were able to take these things and either through filmmaking or revision or just the genius of their personality and will, they were able to create a vision that was in line with their other films, you know, which is, I guess, sort of the auteur theory in a sense. So anyway, I got off subject with the auteur thing. I'm sorry. But basically what I think Suzuki's saying is like at the end, I can see why Tetsu continues to drift if you will, you know, however nonsensical it is. I mean, it's, he's basically, you know, basically at the end, he's like, I'm a loner, daddy, a rebel. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he is. And so, but I think it's a way of Suzuki balancing the Bushido and the American influences, much like you see in the way he mixes up the styles. There's the Japanese Yakuza stuff. And then there's the American stuff. Like, you know, I mean, like, well, so yeah. So Tetsu's like, a, a drifter doesn't need a woman. And it's like, dude, what, what the fuck, man? That doesn't, what are you, the Marshall Tucker band? What the fuck? Yeah, I was going to say, where is that written in the code? <laughs> I know, right? And of course, I mean, you and I have talked about this because we're both fans of these shows. But in a way, you can almost see like the whole middle section. And I guess the very end, which is it, presumably he continues after the film ends. But you can almost see it as very much in line with like TV shows, uh, like, um, you know, The Incredible Hulk yeah. and Kung Fu or uh, uh, Highway to Heaven. Route 66. Yeah, yeah. The Fugitive uh, and, and recently The Mandalorian. Yeah. Have Gun Will Travel. Have Gun Will Travel. Totally. Where you've got like basically these homeless heroes who are um, kind of getting into adventures <laughs> and helping people in distress. I mean, it's like, you know, Knight Rider was sort of like that. Although in that case, for some reason, every time, I don't know, I don't know why this is, but every time Michael Knight needed to help somebody, it was always an attractive young woman. I don't know why that is. There was never any like older Yeah, men. I don't think we know enough about David Hasselhoff to understand why that would be interesting. Right. And actually, I could probably listen to you speak about Hasselhoff for like 20 minutes. Uh, so I suppose we shouldn't say Nobody anymore. Nobody but... should. <laughs> You're like, it should never be spoken of again. So anyway. Um, before I opened up that can of um, possible American influences and, and mixtures and whatnot, Jeez. I think this might be a good time to take a quick intermission, if that's okay. Yeah. I think that's going to open up a much larger conversation. So more on that and, uh, and Tokyo Drifter as a whole as we drift right back. I uh, made dirty calls uh, because I'm a creep. It was only a phone call, but it was a work of art. Talk to me, talk to me, what did you see? You know who you are? Huh? Huh? You're a son of a town and town and town and town. That's just like you. Call me, baby. You gotta understand. I, I thought you were dead. This is the end of your rap. I'm gonna give you like a fucking dope picture. Get 
up. You're acting like a schoolboy. You know what? I feel like a schoolboy. I've never felt like this in my life. This is kind of some fucking movie, you know? We're a fucking team. We're like Starsky and Hodge. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that just a one? Seriously, it's only a film. Welcome back to Project Exploitation. Today we are talking about Tokyo Drifter, the Seijun Suzuki Yakuza picture. Uh, before the break, we had mentioned uh, about the kind of Western influences and, and really uh, components of Tokyo Drifter. And um, one thing I want to bring up really quickly as uh, somebody that is that it reminds me of uh, the works of Chinichiro Watanabe, uh, who is the ah. anime, yeah, the prolific anime creator. Uh, of course, I mentioned him before when we talked about Space Truckers because he had made uh, Space Dandy. Yes. Uh, but also, he's more famously known as the creator of Cowboy Bebop, of the, maybe the most well-known anime in all of uh, of of this country at least and particularly because of that show's mix of east and western influences and i kind of got a cowboy bebop uh vibe almost uh all throughout uh tokyo drifter in a way that i feel like suzuki must be a big influence on watanabe in general because at first i was like okay am i am i westernizing this movie or is there an actual because that's a right. pitfall that a lot of western audiences uh, particularly American audiences <laughs> go through when they watch uh, a foreign film. Is <laughs> they, 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 they tend to look at it through, obviously it's one thing to look at it through the lens of your own culture because that's, you know, inextricable from your own perspective. But sometimes it's kind of like when, uh, when an American person watches an anime and says, why are all the characters in anime white? <laughs> like, well, they're not. You just have, you know, a, a forced perspective there, you know, right. that anything that's not certain, uh, you know, hue must be white, and whatever, <laughs> you know. So, um, right. No, I hear you. But that's a real phenomenon. Like, there are people out there who genuinely think that, like, you know, Cowboy Bebop, other animes like that are, are quote unquote drawn white. And that's hmm. obviously not the case. I mean, there can be certain ones that are trying to draw a more Western person sure. because of where they're setting it, like a, an anime I've seen called Bacchano, which is actually set in America during the 1920s, Prohibition and whatnot. Oh, wow. um, so some of those characters maybe are slightly drawn in a way that suggests a certain nationality. But in general, uh, that's not the case. And and so when I'm watching this, I'm like, okay, you know, is this, it was, like, like I said, am, am I trying to westernize this or, you know, are they really? And for me, it was definitely the time at which uh, you mentioned this in the synopsis, that, that the brawl in the saloon where, oh, Lord. you know, I'm like, this isn't just a signifier of like, oh, salute, like this is full out, you know, the American uh, aspect of this film has like, accidentally taken control almost in a chaotic way um for a brief spell and i absolutely loved that scene and just how ridiculous it uh how how long it went on for and how <laughs> and, I, and i thought that was a funny commentary because that's honestly what a lot of those scenes in american westerns look like you know yeah. like not quite like that but when you're watching them you're just kind of like what the hell is going on? You know, right? And um, I mean, they, they do it in Mash too, where there's a whole episode. I think it's I can't remember if it's in the episode "A Night at Rosie's" where that takes place exclusively at Rosie's. I think it is, but there are other episodes where there had scenes set at Rosie's bar. But if it's not that episode, it's another one where there is an extremely, and of course that was a comedy, but there's an extremely long bar brawl that, I mean, to the point where like characters are coming into the bar and being <laughs> like thrown into like clinger showing up and, you know, oh, things wow. like that. And um, it kind of reminded me of that. But so anyway, um, I, I absolutely love that scene and I could totally see then from that point on both what had come before and what came after. Um, uh, a lot of kind of, uh, I, I wouldn't say necessarily American influences because I wouldn't say it, it, morphed what suzuki 
was trying to do in so much as like the meshing of those two styles where it's kind of like, yeah, you know, um, this kind of Western wind is really starting to blow around uh, in these Eastern lands and and the chaos that kind of ensues uh, from that point on. So what what, what would you uh, say about the Western uh, influences and aspects of this? Well, yeah, it's it's a complex answer. Um, well, first of all, I, I do want to say that uh, some critics have said about the saloon brawl that they were detecting a certain, you know, inchoate anger towards the occupying Yankees. And that's definitely there, by the way. Yeah. But if that's true, I don't think if that was true, Suzuki would be sort of criticizing America with one hand while enthusiastically uh, celebrating its most famous genres with the other. So I don't think it's just straight up. It doesn't come from a straight up place of criticism. It, honestly, this, the scene is so insanely long. It's three and a half minutes and it feels longer. I, I, mean, this is totally my conjecture, but I wondered if John Carpenter was like, I'm going to do it one better with my infamously never ending alley fucking fight scene in They Live with Roddy Piper and Keith, you know, now I have no idea, yeah. but I mean, I'm sure John Carpenter's seen his movies because, you know, he's just one of those omnivorous guys. But I mean, there's, you've got the, you know, John Wayne's, you know, which are the haymakers where you don't get anywhere near the guy. They used to call those John Wayne's like synchronized bottles being broken on guy. You know, I mean, there's a part and I, I didn't even notice this until the most recent time. Like I said, I think this is the fourth time. There's a part during that where two guys get done beating up a waiter and then they like turn and look at each other and they're like, Hey, let's fight each other. <laughs> It's yeah. so completely pointless. Yeah. I mean, and there's even that part where like Tetsu and Kenji and uh, Umatani, they have a moment in the middle when they stop and have a hearty, you know, good natured laugh at, about the whole thing, even though like Umatani's saloon is getting completely trashed and he doesn't seem to have a pro- He's just like, ah, what a what a great bonding experience this has been for us. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I agree. It is it is just uh, ridiculous. Um, and I think it's hard because obviously there's a big. American influence here. But the problem is Suzuki was known for not giving very good straight answers or often just making up crap. He swore, first of all, when he was growing up before World War II, uh, Imperial Japan had extremely strict censorship rules. Nothing from the West got in. So he didn't. So it's, it's almost impossible for him to have seen an American film prior to like his twenties. Right. But then the other thing is he says, I, he's one of those guys who'll be like, I don't really even like movies that much. So he, he, he'd say like, uh, his brother was an essayist and his brother wrote about how, yeah, he and I, we were influenced by stuff kind of up until our mid twenties. And then really the ideas we have are still based on that. We just kind of shut everything out. So it's hard to say. I mean, I, I, I mean, certainly there's more likelihood that Suzuki could have seen Western films after he became a company director for Nikatsu. But again, it's so hard to say. Um, I mean, one of his biographers just flat out says he's like, he never tells the truth, man. You know, it, so it, it's obvious there's Western stuff in there. I mean, the other theory is, and I like this theory a lot is that all of his innovations, well, according to him, grew out of basically boredom and utilitarian problem solving. Because, I mean, he made like, one year, I think he made five movies in a year, which is up there. I mean, that's got to be up there with like Franco or or Soderbergh at their busiest. Yeah. So I think there was that. And then he was just trying to stand apart from the rest of the self-described genre hacks. Like he talked about like, I guess when he was an assistant director, he was just the laziest dude. He would just get drunk during the day and fuck about, totally neglect his duties. And somehow he didn't get fired. I don't know. It's of course, again, he's telling the story. So who knows how bad it really was, but, but he, he talked several times about how the company scripts he would get were so similar. And there was this fear that two directors working with very similar cookie cutter scripts might accidentally make almost the same movie. <laughs> and so there's this like, oh shit, I don't know. So it was a lot of it, I think, had to do with his defining difference. Um, and then like around 1963, 
uh, he really starts fighting this boredom in a big way with experimentation, um, starting with uh, this one called, uh, which I, I would love to do an episode on this one, too. It's uh, Detective Bureau 23, Go to Hell Bastards. <laughs> it's a great title. <laughs> That's a great title. Isn't it? It's it's like Detective Bureau 23, colon, Go to Hell Bastards, exclamation point. Yeah. It's a cap Yakuza film, uh, but it's from the perspective of caps. But Arrow has a really good version of it. Um, highly recommend. But the other theory is there's this guy, um, Chris DeJardins, who's a pretty big Suzuki head. He's like one of those guys who really champions him. He wrote a book called like Outlaw Masters of Japanese Cinema, and he's got a big chapter about Suzuki. And DeJardins theory, which I love, and I believe it's almost gets to the heart of why exploitation films are so fascinating and so worthy of yours and my attention, is that DeJardins theory was... Basically, between 65 and 68, Nikatsu started to slash his budgets as a punitive measure. It was like, you're getting too weird. Like he, The first one was, I think, this movie, Kondo Wanderer, I think. I can't remember. I haven't seen it. But anyway, they were like, okay, you're on notice, buddy. Nice try. <laughs> we're going to keep our eye on you. And so they would like continue to punish him by giving him less budget. And I know you and I have talked about this Uh so Desjardins theory is that because they, you know, he was warned to make more normie stuff. So they started giving him less money. He basically responded by eschewing things like master establishing shots, you know, so the, so the footage and he, he would only shoot like what he wanted. There was no like extra stuff. I mean, part of that, I think right. was the concept of coverage is kind of thrown out the window. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like with um, I can't remember if it was um, Louis B. Mayer complained about Hitchcock and his jigsaw editing because he, he didn't film a scene that he didn't know he was going to use. I mean, he's like, I, I, there's no, oh, let's just do an improv take. And there's nothing like that. And Suzuki, partly for money and partly for time, because, again, I mean, some of these, they had to be done in like 20 days. So basically, he starts getting rid of the establishing shots and the stuff that kind of the stuff that um. Like if if for those those of you listening who don't know a ton about film technique, it, it's the stuff that kind of plants you in an environment and you get an idea of where you are. You know, some, it's often a long shot or 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 a shot of a larger part of the room. And a lot of times he just wouldn't do those setups, you know, and again, it was because they were punishing him. So he was like, fine, I'm going to give you exactly the money you want because, you know, he'd always come in under budget. And so the the footage gets this really oddly stitched up feel. Um, and so Desjardins' theory is that these abrupt scene changes, where it feels like you're directly jumping into the thick of a scene, like immediately to a close up or like weird angles, that all has to do with the fact that, uh, to use a Lars von Trier term, uh, Suzuki was getting they were putting obstructions in his way and that, and Desjardins thinks that's what made him go from being a good craftsman to a great artist. And and I think it's true. I mean, we all have to kind of fight against something. If we have, you know, it's like, you know, I remember in art class, they would say, okay, here's a blank piece of paper. Just draw whatever you want this time. No, no assignment. And it's like, Oh man, you're just paralyzed by all the possibilities. But if you're stuck and you're like, okay, well we've got this set. You know, it's like Corman. It's like, okay, we have this, we have this costume. We got to make a movie around it. You know, and it's interesting because um, this one guy, uh, Ian Buruma, he says something really interesting here that I, I'm going to quote in full. He's he compares him to uh, Tatsumi Kumashiro, who made pink films in Japan. I'm, I think you've seen some of them. And uh, Ian Buruma says, as long as he made the so-called soft porno films for Nikatsu. He was like Suzuki, an eccentric genius. But when he decided to shake off the fetters of his genre, he rather lost his way. The secret of Suzuki's or Kamashiro's art was the tension between the constraints of the genres and their eccentric imaginations. Porno and Yakuza films gave them a set of rules to play with, to stretch, even to break. Without the rules, they lost their anchors. So in other words, it's like you need some obstructions to bring out the ingenuity in the problem solving. So in a sense, it's that tension that's sort of kicking against the pricks is so central, I think, to why not just Suzuki's films are so great, but so many great B-movies and exploitation movies right. are so much better than people give them credit. Because it's like, well, look look what they were up against and look what they did with it. They, they made decisions they probably would have never if they had been given a huge budget, you know, and all the time in the world. So yeah. I that's 
one theory to kind of that's a circuitous way to answer your question, but this one theory as to why his stuff feels like it has Western elements. I mean, some of it's obvious. I mean, he's obviously I mean the saloon brawl is Westerns, literally Westerns. Uh there's musicals, uh other stuff like that. But at the same time, it seems like he may not have seen all that many movies after a certain point because I mean, it sounded like the dude was just working like a mofo. Like he didn't even I don't think he took time to do anything except do these things. So, well, I I don't know if that answers the question, but it's it's yeah. it's just a it's one possibility, I guess. Oh, absolutely. And I think too one thing could be said is that possibly if, you know, he has an innate uh, desire to be rebellious in some nature, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the opposite of East is West, you know, and of course, I don't mean that to be uh, literally as far as like the opposite of Japan is, you know, uh, America mm-hmm. or anything like mm-hmm. that. But the simple act of kind of doing the opposite of what was considered the norm, uh, even just out of, you know, uh, stubbornness, uh, you're going to stumble on practices that are done uh, over here, you know, in uh, America and whatnot. So it could be just as simple as that, you know, it could, that could explain maybe if he's telling the truth about not seeing a lot of Western movies. Right. But, you know, the other thing too is that, um, you know, I, I don't quite buy that because of the fact that, you know, um, when each respective country's uh, film studio and system whatnot got off the ground, you know, I, I don't mean this to be simplistic just as a, you know, uh, it, uh, it is an analog, which is that, you know, mm-hmm. when Westerns became popular, samurai films became popular, you know, like it's it's one of those things where it's like we're not so different, you and me, because <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, like the things that get are popular are essentially innate within a human being, no matter where they're from and whatnot. So, you know, I I think to reject the, you know, the, the honor system of the past. So if, if, I guess I'll say like this, if Japan's uh, early days uh, was a very samurai heavy and and things of that nature, and that ultimately comes down to honor and, and loyalty and whatever, definitely, you know, look at America's, early days, which is very Western heavy and Western, you know, even if they were technically about justice, which is almost the opposite of honor, right? Because True. not quite, but the the idea of justice is that what's fair is fair. Well, technically honor essentially says fairness means nothing. What matters is obedience and, and your adherence to something. Totally. So, you know, yeah. The wild, wild west, literally, is something that is chaotic and not bound to a code, even though, uh, you know, certainly a lot of them try to propose the the, the code of, of the, the sheriff or the code of uh, the wandering vagabond, whatever. Right. But usually that was almost like just trying to mythologize its own genre and kind of whatever. Right. Most of my favorite westerns are the ones where, you know, like, like Rio Bravo, where John Wayne is actually just trying to do what's right, not because it's a code, but because, you know, it's just that's his job. He's the sheriff of this town, and it happens that there's problems in it, you know, that kind of thing. So, that's a good point. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's all tied up together. Um, and so I, I definitely think he was uh, either directly or indirectly uh, certainly responding to a lot of things that were happening uh culturally across the world and not just in uh japan but i wanted to ask you yes. uh what your thoughts were on the musicality of this movie ah yes um okay so well first let me read you this quote which seems a little off topic but hopefully it'll make sense okay so from what i've been reading it seems like suzuki's central lifelong project as an artist was to try to dismantle the illusions and artifice of film. Now, I don't know if he did it because he was just anarchic or because he just did not respect authority in any form, but he, he would, he, there's a quote here where he says, I think what remains in our memory is not construction, but destruction. Making things is not what counts. The power that destroys them is. Now, the reason I mention that is because one of the ways he constantly is destroying the illusions is through these weird, uh, often very Bertolt Brechtian, actually distancing effects, these alienation effects. And I think the music 
is a perfect example of that. I mean, there are, uh, you know, just the fact of the reoccurring theme uh, in itself, you know, it makes you feel like you were dropped into a Technicolor picture every 15 minutes or so. I love that. I mean, and and, uh, now, of course, I mean, nowadays, like, you know, in the last 30 years, a lot of Indian films do this. It's it's very, even their very serious films will have musical production numbers and dancing and such. But I mean, well, first of all, I love the song. I think it's like the perfect, like, cocktail of, uh, you know, like Ricky Nelson or Del Shannon and, and Neil Morricone. And then, like, it's the melody is kind of this, like, pseudo Japanese pentatonic scale. I mean, I don't really know the scales, so I, I, I kind of did my best to figure it out and I looked it up, but it, it, it's it's probably more like, orientalism not actual you know japanese pentatonic but i love like one of my favorite parts in the movie is that part where tetsu like swoops in and saves the day for those uh allies of his in the north yeah because they're like super outmanned right and he's he's singing at his normal volume as he approaches uh the the baddies there and they can hear him the osuka assassins hear him it's like a harbinger which is such a classic musical genre device. And it's so jarring to see it here. And I think part of it is uh, the jarring is part of the point. I mean, I love the one guy. He's like, damn him and his singing. <laughs> it's like, it's like, oh, here he comes. He's going he's, he's gonna to fuck our shit up, you know? And I mean, actually, there's, and speaking of uh, other artifice things here, I mean, there's even a part where we hear him singing when he's wounded, uh, even though he's, clearly his mouth isn't moving and he's like staggering away and it's like wait the theme is going so there'll be times when the music is going with him like you said it's um diegetic and then other times where it's like oh now it's become score (laughs) you know and I, i think again it's something that suzuki is doing all the time to try to mess with our genre expectations i guess yeah i mean some of the stuff is like stylistic but it's like But it's, you know, like, yeah, you don't see Otsuka's face for the first, like, 28 minutes. That's, like, that's a, that's a thing. But there's other shit, man, that is just super weird, absurd, uh, gangster, cliche, disruptions, stuff like, like, my favorite one, <laughs> and I, I feel like you're going to probably even know what I'm going to say here, the, is this impossibly absurd part near the beginning where Otsuka's goons try to kidnap uh, uh, Chiharu? Yeah, yeah. And first of all, Suzuki makes it like super confusing at the beginning because he uses all these ellipses to destabilize us. He's like, doesn't show them pulling a gun. We just see them pointing the gun at her as she's coming out and they're leading her to the car. <laughs> so then they get in the car and they're like, ah, yes. <laughs> you know, they're like, we got her. We got her. Now we're going to hold her for ransom. And wait, who's driving the car? Oh, shit. It's Tatsu. <laughs> As if that wasn't weird enough, boom, they cut. And it's like Tetsu and Chiharu, they're out on the town on a date. Like, oh, wasn't that just a funny interlude? Oh, ha, 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 ha. You know, no explanation. Yeah. Never alluded to ever again. Uh, It's just out of freaking nowhere. I mean, that scene, if it wasn't in the movie, no one would notice because it's so not important to the plot. But it's all these weird non-sequiturs. And I think the music does that. I mean, I think there's a part where... And I, again, I only noticed this the most recent time I watched it. But there's a part where Tetsu's on the phone and he's listen. He can hear music in the club on the phone. And then he, yes, it, right. It's so dis- disorienting. He well, says, and that's also how he knows where it's, I think, because doesn't he ask whoever, maybe it was um, it, the secretary, but he says, where's, where's the club that so-and-so sings at? Right. Yes. And I almost feel like that was a weird in-universe thing that essentially that's how he knew where to go. Right. Like, or what to look for. I could be wrong. Maybe it was music over the loudspeaker, but I think that's who was performing there that night, even though we're never shown that there even is a performer. But I think that's what that line of dialogue is refers to. I think you're right. Because I don't think it's even over a speed because cause he hangs up the phone and the music stops, right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden it starts up again. It's clearly the same song. It's it's as if the song, it's like we've missed the same amount of the song where it's been playing that whole, you know, I mean, yep. just bizarre, man. I mean, it's just. And part of that, I, I sometimes chalk up to somebody like Jess Franco, where I don't think it means that Suzuki was always a hundred percent on the ball when it comes to maybe like continuity and whatnot. Sure. Not because it means he was a bad filmmaker, but I just think that could be something he just didn't care if it matched up. 
And, you know, and I think somebody like Jess Franco, for example, is the same way where it's like, I, it doesn't matter. This is what I'm seeing in my head. So as long as it gets onto the screen, why does it matter if, you know, these things break the reality? Right. Right. No, I agree. So I wanted to talk a little bit about color in sets because you talked about it earlier. Yeah. So one thing he said, uh, apparently in 1963, he met a production designer, uh, Kamira Takeo, and he worked with him for every film he did after that. Uh, and he says that collaboration for me was decisive. It was with Kimura that I began to work on ways of making the fundamental illusions of cinema more powerful. <laughs> yeah. And I think he does it more in Tokyo Drifter than any of his previous flicks and maybe any of his films. I mean, the, the colors and the lighting become like a narrative tool, but not just for transgressive aesthetics, not just because it's like, hey, look at this shit, you know, which is in itself is still great. I still enjoy art for art's sake. But like, for instance, at the beginning, there's a lot of stuff that, again, these are things that I'm only really catching now. But at the beginning, there's that um, the black and white pre-credit sequence, right? Where you're talking about him getting beaten up. Yeah. Well, the, the that was expired black and white stock they were using. And the idea, so they had no idea what it was going to look like when it was done. I was going to say, because it's so overexposed. Oh, yeah. It's super just like... To the point where I thought the two main characters in that scene were in blackface. Oh, wow. No kidding. I actually could kind of see that. Well, like, I didn't genuinely think that that's... But when I had just kind of squint to see the seams of the film versus what was happening, like, makeup job or if there was one, you know, because at first I was like... And, you know, maybe that's just because I had recently rewatched Godzilla versus Kong where there's actual uh, blackface uh, on Asian actors because really? they go to... a. Uh, yeah, to an island where it's full of quote unquote primitives and whatnot. Yes. Uh it's probably more of like a quote unquote brown face. <laughs> Even though it's technically You're not making it sound better. <laughs> yeah, I mean I, but like I, I don't mean it I, I I'm only making the distinction to say that in order to portray primitive culture, I don't think they were being quote unquote African. Oh, I see. I, but they were definitely smearing a darker shade of, uh, you know, to show the island natives in a way that would be akin to, uh, like, you know, it was, it looked like the Eastern version of blackface. Right. It right. It's again, it's almost, it's the, uh, mirror image of Orientalism. Just talking about it. I'm going to say something racist, but that's, that's as best as I can articulate it. Uh, no, I understand. I mean, e each culture has its stereotypes about others. There's no doubt about it. I mean, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I feel like that's interesting though, what you said though, about that, how, how, how dark it looked. I mean, I think it's a hat tip to older Yakuza films. You know, the ones that are kind of the classics and the templates. And, and I mean, that goes back to like, um, I think the first post-war Yakuza film was Akira Kurosawa's film Drunken Angel, which isn't really a Yakuza film. It has strong gang elements. Um, Toshiro Mufune plays a, a gangster. He's one of the two main characters. Anyway, uh, so you've got that. And then there's like um, oh, old movies like... Uh, Humanity and Paper Balloons, which is like this comedy involving Yakuza. I've never seen it, but it's from the 30s. So I think he's referencing or hat tipping to all those, including, you know, the movies he had made before. And it's funny because immediately after Tetsu is beaten up, Suzuki seems to do some like pretty, like I thought pretty clear allusions to a couple famous Japanese master filmmakers. And one thing is he starts cutting to a series of like unrelated static shots of, um, you know, buildings in the dock and stuff. And that struck me as very much an homage to something Ozu was famous for, which is where he would add what they called pillow shots, uh, which are these like shots during scene transitions where you've got like unrelated stuff like skylines and boats and buildings and, and that, you know what I mean? Like that's. Yeah. For, I mean, for a zoo, it was very like industrial images. Right. Okay. Back to our domestic tranquility. Right. Right. And it does work. I mean, it's a really good transitional tool um, to the point where it's done so much now we don't even think about it, but I think uh, that was very much one of his innovations. And then after all those shots, it cuts to a stray dog <laughs> who appears to actually be panting from the heat 
with his tongue out. And I'm like, this is a clear reference to the opening credits of Stray Dog by Kurosawa, which literally it just shows a dog going. <laughs> the titular Stray Dog. Indeed. So I'm just like, OK, I feel like Suzuki's like, here, I know about this stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm tipping my hat to it, but now get ready for something totally different, which I think is part of why he went from black and white at the beginning to color, because it makes it even bolder. You know, it's it's like in the way that um, like the Wizard of Oz, how you go from black and white to color and it makes it so much more. Uh, the contrast is so, so jarring and so vibrant, you know, or like like Soderbergh does it in uh, Shea. He's got those kind of newsreel things at the beginning yeah. and then it goes to color or like in, uh, well, he very famously did it in, in Kafka uh, where like the climax is filmed in like brilliant color. Oh yeah. It, so it, it really just leaps out at you. I mean, I've always really admired that he did that actually. Yep. I have to admit, I, as a Suzuki uh, newcomer, mm -hmm. when I watched that opening, you know, sequence and then it went into color and then the rest of the movie, you know, went on. I was thinking that there was a possibility and then I quickly think I never, I didn't really look into it, but I, I just assumed that it wasn't this. But I at first thought that maybe this was like a case of something like um, uh, the movie If, mm. where due to some kind of budgetary snafu or due to, you know, uh, studio meddling, because I knew that that was a big thing with Suzuki as far as the studio not giving him what he needs or wants, that maybe it was a case of like okay well we have black and white stock for these for you know these scenes and then uh most of the film is in color but we don't have it you know for the whole thing we don't have <laughs> enough money to develop that or something especially due to how harsh and overexposed that film stock was so i, I genuinely thought at least for a moment that maybe that was just due to like uh yeah we can't really you know like these scenes aren't as important, so therefore we're just gonna show them as is or whatever. But right, well, I mean, uh, you're right in a sense because um, Nikatsu, the company, would uh, the 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 biggest profile films were shot in color, and the others, the quickies, were mostly shot in black and white. I, I agree, though, and he did it earlier in another film called Youth of the Beast, where it has an introduction uh, in black and white, and it also has like in the beginning of Tokyo Drifter, there's that scene where he sees the, like the, the toy gun on the tracks there. And it's the only thing in color. He is, he does something similar in youth of the beast where I think it's a flower of some kind. Um, it was, or cherry blossom maybe, which is a very Japanese image, you know? And so, yeah, I, I agree though. I mean, you could easily see it as being something where it's like, like you said with if or, or whatever, it's like, well, shit, this is all we got left. We're going to do this, you know? And, but, but I mean, what it does is it makes the color, I mean, this is already one of the most inventive films f for use of color that I've ever seen. I mean, and I'm, I put that with anything even today. So it's already bold, but when you add the black and white, then going to that, it's like I said, it's like the Wizard of Oz or something, you know, it, it will, it also, you know, there's the secretary, the, oh God, what is her name? I'm going to run her something. M Mutsuko. Uh, she's always reading comic books and maybe this is what put me in mind, but like there's times definitely, it's definitely clear that, um, Suzuki and the production designer are like color coordinating the world sometimes around Tetsu. And of course, but it's, it's actually for a narrative point. I mean, like as he gets farther away, it, he becomes more jarred with everything else as opposed to at the beginning where he's very simpatico with his surroundings like when he leaves uh chiharu uh he calls her on the phone and like his suit his you know the blue suit he wears through the whole movie is the exact same color as that phone and it almost reminded me of um uh warren Beatty's movie dick tracy where oh, yeah. um, i don't yeah. know if you've seen that yeah one of the things i always love the most about it is every color is the same it's very much a comic book movie in the sense that this shade of red for this building is the same shade of red as the phone in the police headquarters is the same shade of red as, you know, the blood right, or right, whatever. Right. The same way as if you have a red pencil and you color red here, it's going to come out the same. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I will say I, I'm, I'm totally with you in the color coordination department uh, with regards mm. to this movie, because one thing I kind of chuckle that was that um, you don't see uh, Asuka's uh suit for the first like 20 minutes because he's always wearing the big uh jacket yeah. over it and the moment he takes it off it's the exact uh diametrically opposed color to 
Tetsu's blue, it's this very garish red. And totally. so I, I thought the the fact that that you know they were kind of hiding and withholding that until it literally comes off of him. Uh, and even the camera almost does a quick zoom pan uh, at that moment. I just, I just thought that was like a a dumb little punchline, which I don't mean as a pejorative, but just as kind of very garish, like, <laughs> you know, whatever. No, I, I agree. Well, how about um, that scene where Chiharu is singing in the club? And now when you first see Chiharu in the club, it's like this gold world. She's like in this gold lame womb. It's yeah. just warm and beautiful. And so she's like, Suzuki ends up using that red a lot to forebode, to show foreboding. Like Chihara, she's singing, and then suddenly the chandelier dra- drapey thing behind her turns red. And you're like, what's the deal there? And then boom, they cut to Otsuka in his red suit, his red jacket. And it's like, red alert, <laughs> red alert, red alert, yeah. you know? And, and again, you see this red, the same shade of red or very close to it in the on the phone when they're doing the impersonation call so even before you know who's impersonating who you know something's amiss so like even if you don't speak the language or you didn't have subtitles you'd still go oh wait a minute this is the same color as the baddie so something 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 screwy here you know i just i love that kind of visual um extrapolation of not just plot but even character i mean you see it a well you see the character stuff a lot i mean it's all sorts of weird things like, um, well, there's a lot of red, I mean, obviously, but there's like that part um, during his showdown with Tatsu, if you will, where he's at the train tracks. And sometimes it's like Suzuki um, in this case, in some other cases, he uses the color as like a way to get you on the same focus line as what Tetsu sees. So it's like, um, let's see, in that case, it's like a, you see this imaginary 10 meters hash mark in red on the train tracks. He's like, mm, 10 meters. <laughs> and I mean, this is a totally weird aside, but it almost feels like Suzuki's like predicting uh, what's, what's now a very common visual cue that you see in like pro football coverage where the producers will put down, like, oh, yeah. you know, like a bright CGI line yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to signify the overlays basically. Right. It's like, yeah. okay, this is the amount of yardage needed for first down. And it's like the same thing. He's like, I need to get to here in order to shoot accurately. <laughs> Yep. I just, I fucking love it. Yeah. Now, Suzuki did one time, again, you got to take this with a grain of salt. He did once explain his color key and how it relates to his emotions and what he thinks. So he says, uh, okay, I'll just read it to you here. So again, you know, yeah. grain of salt. <laughs> Green represents peace and calm. Red stands for sudden eruptions and fear. Yellow stands for niceness and compromise. And purple for inner revelation. Recently, I've been using white for solitude and uncertainty. Uh, so whether that translates to all his movies, I think that's probably pretty true for Tokyo Drifter. because he's... Well, and what's interesting is he doesn't say anything in that quote, at least, about blue, yeah. which is, you know, the color of the Tokyo Drifter, which actually makes even more sense because he's really supposed to you know, like a drifter fit into any situation and be calm and collected enough where his emotional state is never dictating the tone of the scene because it's always other people's. Right, right. Well, like a drifter, he was born to walk alone, as Coverdale of White Snake once said. Ain't that the truth? Yep. Yeah, but it's like, well, I think we talked about this a little before, like, uh, well, all, just the confusion between Chiharu and the, and the secretary, uh, Mutsuko, I think is her name here. But it, it, it's obvious that Suzuki's using, like I said, it's narrative stuff to move it along. Like, okay, here's the 10 meter. You're seeing what he sees. It's a shorthand. But then other times it's like uh, to exteriorize what the characters are feeling. Like, boom, Chiharu sees Otsuka up there and she goes, oh shit. And the chandelier changes, you know, and it's like, externalizing their emotional states like i said so like this is like there's that part um this is one i think one of the most audacious parts uh which is really saying something but uh during the death of the secretary uh first of all so beautifully done because she's always leaning over and laughing and so she's leaning over and then boom she falls over so when she falls out of the chair the wall behind her appears like you know a split horizontal between red and, and white and then when Tetsu comes into the frame, remember he's like backing up. They're like, okay, that's it for the day. And when he goes into the frame, it turns full on red, which I, again, maybe is danger because the guy is about to shoot him. And then Tetsu shoots 
the boyfriend who's trying to shoot him, and then the wall goes totally white. So it starts off red and white, then red, and then finally white. And and then the club stuff is even more blatant. I mean, at the beginning, like I said, we see all these beautiful golden colors and everything's great. And then Tetsu leaves and these golden colors on the club, you start to see like they're almost like infected by reds and purples. And then once Otsuka takes over the club, it's just it's flat out black. I mean, it's just like, and, and so there's Otsuka and uh, Kurata, and they're wearing black suits. They're like disappearing into it. I mean, they're like so corrupted that you, they're swallowed up by the dark. I mean, there's, and there's only like that one light on that poor piano player. God bless him. You know, the one who had to perform at gunpoint. He did his job. He did. He did. But there's just that. And then there's a red light on the donut sculpture thing, which is one of my favorite things in any movie is the donut sculpture thing. I, I love that. <laughs> but like the thing is, and so when Tetsu walks in and he's wearing white for the first time, it's the only time you see him. Every other time was blue before that. So I guess it's sort of like showing him maybe an emotional realization or evolution. Like, okay, I was betrayed. I need to think for myself or whatever. So he comes through the door, like the light from the doorway just partially transforms the whole club into glittering white. Like there's no way that much light from that one doorway could light the whole room. It's as if like, it's incredible. It's like Tetsu's oh, yeah. mere presence and charisma is like the torch of justice. <laughs> So there's just always this constant play of colors. And it, like I said, it doesn't feel realistic, but it feels like we kind of know what Suzuki's saying. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think Suzuki was a huge influence on a lot of uh, Japanese directors that followed in his wake in the 70s and whatnot. I mean, like a movie like uh, Female Prisoner Scorpion has a gorgeous color palette, yeah. uh, both in the foreground at times, but a lot of times in the background where... For whatever reason, this scene is going to be lit almost entirely by blue, or this scene's going to, it's that very uh, primary color influence. Oh, yeah. And I mean, that's one of my favorite things about that movie, too, when I saw it with you, was the scenes where it would go from, it would be lit one way, and then the shot would remain, it would still be the same static shot, but the lighting would dramatically change because of a character's presence. It was so yeah. cool. Yeah, it's very, um, you know stage like so to speak where um i'm sure it's influenced by a lot of uh, japanese theater right yeah and so uh, one of the other things i noticed was um like i said as the uh, sets get darker and i sort of talked about this with the last episode too where like with the setting in sex world uh with uh, millicent where it's this sort of strange uh we used to call them um in college we'd hear them, like those spacious kind of disembodied sets we call them like limbo sets or infernal sets oh yeah you know because it's like they feel like they're scenery like from outtakes from like the back lot scenes in singing in the rain or like um those backgrounds that were semi-formless that they would like set the the singer on in 60s and 70s variety shows or like you know somebody singing and you're like wait where it's the you know the background the the distance between him and the wall is not clear and yeah, it feels like the bit... set dressing kind of stopped at about a quarter of the way through and so normally the camera would be further than that so you don't have to see that but instead it, it, it leaves it all into the picture right so it becomes like this cross between american bandstand and like lynch's black lodge <laughs> yeah where it's like because lynch's black lodge is like super confined yeah but at the same time you're like well how big is the whole thing i don't really know you know yeah so yeah and i, I did notice tetsu does say at the end if i don't bust out of this hell i'll have no future so i wonder if if the infernal or limbo thing was somewhat intentional on the part of, uh, you know, the uh, the set designer Takeo. I, I don't know. The lighting and the set design and the gels and, and all that, they're, the, the lens filters, they're like side comments and exclamation points, too. I mean, of course, like all, all filmmakers that are true masters at the art, you know, are using things like framing and editing and lighting and all sorts of stuff to subtly suggest the characters, what the characters are feeling, but it's, it's audience manipulation in the best way in the, in the, you know, I'm in the hands of a master, but it's like Suzuki is making it super conspicuous. It's like he, he's uh, dead set on showing us the actual puppet strings now, but to, 
But to what end? Yes, right? What to, to In aid of what, we ask ourselves? I was just about to ask that. <laughs> one may ask oneself, and one may be correct in asking such a thing. Now, so the thing is, uh, uh, Ian Baruma, who I mentioned earlier, is a like I said, he's a pretty well-respected uh, Western uh, academic on most things culturally Japan, all that. Oh, I thought you were talking about the guy who was in train spotting. Ian Baruma was in train. Isn't the actor in that named? Uh, oh, nice! Ian, oh, what is it? yes, he played Spud. Yeah. Anyway, that was my dumb. Uh, <laughs> no, that was great. I loved it. Joke. <laughs> no, I loved it. You and Bremer. I'm, I'm actually a fan. I'm oh, a that's joke. what his name. Is. I was like, I know it's phonetically similar. I couldn't remember what the name was. It is. It is. No, you were you were not too far off. Actually, I'm surprised it took me that long. So, <laughs> so but yes. So Ian Bruma, uh, he talks about uh, the idea that. Suzuki has this ability to give audiences the release of what he calls a ritualized catharsis. But I think, I mean, he may be right, but it ain't catharsis like in the kind of way that you and I do our catharsis. You know what I mean? We don't catharsis the way that Suzuki's catharsis seen. And uh, I, I mean, especially in his later films, I mean, he's really obviously frustrating that release uh, we want by building up in the skipping past climactic action, like we expect is part and parcel of the genre, you know? And so it's something that keeps happening, keeps alighting things like, uh, there's a ton of it in the snow shootout or the part where the assassins burst into Tetsu's place. There's all these ellipses where you don't quite know what's happening. It's almost like Suzuki's like, it's almost like a trickster figure where the catharsis comes not from us watching, you know, the shit get blowed up real good. But from laughing at the surprise, laughter, even or actually even especially during the violent scenes. And um, he'll kind of break up the momentum by adding these weird, inexplicable shots. Like, like what, what did you think about like that close up of that some hand holding an unashed cigarette at one point? It just it was only one shot. We have no idea where oh, it comes yeah. from or where it goes. I genuinely kind of forgot about that until you just mentioned it. But I remember when those kind of things, uh, you know. Uh, happen on screen. I mean, my first impulse whenever anything like that happens in any movie is to just use the word Godardian. Right. <laughs> um, not because it's super, you know, uh, abstract, but because the editing is super self-conscious about cutting up any sense of a normal rhythm. Right. Um, and I think, you know, Suzuki is certainly doing that less as a trickster, but more to kind of quite literally add, like, I would say beats to yeah. a scene, especially a choreographed scene like violence is, because violence is always choreographed, uh, True. you know, on a in in a mise en scene, um, and we're even it's not the same as that as far as that kind of cutaway, but the um, the final shootout, you know, mm -hmm. in the bar uh, or the club is like a is fantastic, but b it's also a, a peak of the movies like. Uh, I guess I want to say escalation <laughs> of the mythologizing of both the Tokyo Drifter himself, but also in the way violence is choreographed in this film. I mean, it quite literally almost climaxes uh, with the the move where he throws uh, <laughs> he throws the gun up in the air, right? Yep. Um, and then is able to uh, still catch it uh, after he, you know, whatever, dispatches another one and then catch it and then still use it. And, you, you know, it's little things like that where, you know, because I don't think I would have not bought it, but maybe a little bit of bought it, maybe appreciated it had anything like that occurred in the first half hour, you know, because sure. at that point, you know, he's still a new character to the audience, but it says a lot about Suzuki's command of tone and, and editing the rhythms of that, that by the time we get to that final, like eight minutes or so, cause it's a really quick ending, you know, I mean, the, by the time the shootout happened, there's only about like seven minutes of footage left and mm -hmm. the shootout itself pretty much happened within the span of about a minute to two. And, and when that happened, Happened, you know, by that time, the movie itself has essentially earned all of those flights of fancy <laughs> due to the way it would continually break with uh, tradition uh, in how it was edited and how the characters went about things. But it was a slow, a slow process, I think, to get there. It wasn't just all out, you know, kind of like Takashi Miike, for example, who I think is clearly influenced by Suzuki, but he 
went like a bullet train <laughs> in that direction sure. and and he does it from the first shot <laughs> and then tries to that the second shot tops the first shot <laughs> so on and so forth you know and, and i love his style too uh, in fact, i'm a huge fan of him but you know this it's funny how much we talk about suzuki tonight I still want to give him credit for being restrained at times because I don't think he's as outlandish as it's easy to uh, pigeonhole him as. I think there's mm-hmm. so much happening in every frame that um, those moments always stand out, but they're also not the only thing that make him up, so to speak. That was kind of a tangent, but... No, 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 it's true. I think you're right about the pacing, and I do feel like there's an accumulation, like um, uh, the, the way he keeps breaking up the momentum, it starts happening more and more, and things become odder. So like like you said, that final shootout, it's, it's odd, but it's like we're reaching the apex of it, and it seems like natural from the pacing to go there. You know, for some reason, yeah, what you just said reminded me a little bit of this... Um, documentary i saw many years ago about Thelonious monk i think it's called straight no chaser and he's basically they're interviewing the guy who played drums with him and uh the guy goes well you know he taught me how to play drums he's like i thought i knew how to play drums but like i would come out and i'd be like i'm hitting all the things at once and i'm you know doing all the fills but he's like that's not how you start a conversation you don't go hey blah, 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 blah. he says you start out and you go like boom boom hey how are you boom boom hi i'm blah 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 boom 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 yeah. And then you started, you know, so it's like it's this, sl- you know, you're not trying to like blow people through the back of the stage or something. And I think that's true. Suzuki may be compared to uh, Mike, although, you know, to be honest, it's a, it's a lot of times past. So, I mean, maybe Mike feels like, well, you know, Suzuki already did this. I have to I have to do something, you know, or whatever. And God knows uh, Mike is a very uh, <laughs> prolific guy, too. I mean, Jesus, you know. Oh, yeah. and and similar to Suzuki, he doesn't always get enough credit for when he does actually show restraint. Because mm. while that's certainly his signature, I mean, you know, those, those Dead or Alive movies, or you know, uh, you know, uh, Ichi the Killer, or whatever. Like that's his signature style. For our, for every one of those, he still does things like audition, you know, right. which is certainly uh, a graphic film, but is actually a very measured story and has a very uh, collected pace. Oh, God, yeah. I mean, that is a very, very slow build. And it's only near the end that you realize, oh, I've been feeling this dread the whole time. Like, if you go into a cold, it's it's shocking. But at the same time, you're like, oh, yeah, there's been these kind of weird, I believe they're almost like little dream sequences, you know, where, you know, just just tiny fragments. And it's like, oh, God, you know, I'm in the middle of this not quite romantic comedy, but, you know, romantic drama or whatever it's a romantic comedy in Mieke land <laughs> well yeah it's a romantic comedy according to the character in the lead until it isn't i think he's like oh this is perfectly ethical to do this you well, know the but- only person who's not laughing at that point is him because the audience uh not to say that everybody would find it funny but <laughs> technically speaking uh you know uh the audience is not entirely against uh Mm -hmm. you know the the trajectory so to speak (laughs) well yeah i mean it's it's a it's certainly he's learning a harsh lesson maybe harsher than he deserves but (laughs) yeah i agree i agree he's not innocent you know (laughs) but uh so i gotta ask you about some of these other uh weird things like you mentioned godard and there's this moment uh, again there's all these weird times where Suzuki will add something. I don't think he's just trying it out for fun. I think he's doing it to keep us on our toes to an extent. Um, Like he's got this uh, thing where all of a sudden he starts superimposing like newspaper headlines during that one scene where they're looking at the box. Yeah. And it's the only time he does it. He doesn't come back to it again later. It's very, it is very Godardian. That although like the secretary dies yes. so like the transition is essentially just text on the screen which, you know, you, you have to you have to read it to understand that that's even what it is, you know, the fact that it is a newspaper headline. Right. But I agree with you in that it's the only time, because it's the only time that it's used in the movie, it has a striking effect that, you know, I, I think I think you're right in that he does these things purposefully. But also the fact is that when it's time to maybe do something like that, I feel like if the guy in the editing booth says, well, you know, consistently we haven't <laughs> done that throughout the rest of the picture, and so maybe we should cut to a visualization of a newspaper, I feel like it's almost, I feel like sometimes he might be trying to keep us on its toes, but sometimes it's kind of like that self-indulgence that like I talked about, like Franco, for example, like where he's like, well, why does it matter if we've never done it before? I want to do it for this shot. You know what I mean? And, And, you know, so it's almost like taking each scene as its own micro narrative and just doing what's the ultimate good for each uh, 
you know, short passage of time. I think you're right, actually, because I mean, that explains like why he has that one part where he has the 10, the, the 10 meter, the red mark. And it's the only time they have that. Yeah. But again, I mean, it, both both this and the newspaper headline stuff, they definitely further the narrative. It's not just um, just this uh, like outlandish or outrageous thing. It's it's something that actually helps clarify what's going on in the plot, you know. Uh, so it's 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 odd shorthand that you don't expect to see and you don't see it again later. So a lot of people wouldn't do it, but it does it does actually further things along, which is more than I can say for what the freaking deal is with those timeouts in the middle of the plot. There's two of them for product placements for Charm Lady hair dryer. You notice that? I, how could you have not noticed it? I, I did notice the hair dryer, yes, because I remember thinking, why do I now know the product? Like, I'm like, is this going to be a tie into the plot where like the company mm. is going to then like be, you know, like uh, one of uh, Osaku's, you know, uh, like holdings or something like that? Uh, but no, and um, you know, honestly, I I know we keep drawing comparisons to a movie that's not related to this at all, but because it's fresh in our minds of our last episode we did, which was Sex World. Sure. But that moment reminded me of uh, what I crowned as the Beef Shack, uh, <laughs> you know, um, right. where it's this abrupt moment of pure capitalism, yes. uh, just wedged right in the middle of a genre in which certainly as capitalism does to all things uh you know is always present but is never usually at the forefront of uh of the purpose of any of these kind of pictures right i mean i would say like even in the 80s which i think of as kind of the ultimate zenith of product placement stuff in movies yeah even then it was you didn't see them usually like cut to a poster for the product. I mean, there's a, you know, they do right. that. They're like, that oh. was for TV. Right. It's so bizarre. Well, and the, but then, then later on, he's at the Western Saloon and Tetsu and Umatani just casually begin extolling the virtue of the light punch model dryer, which apparently is another model than the Charm Lady, you know, line. It's just bizarre. And it, it, again, it, I, I love it because it's so strange and it, it, I, I don't know if it was one of those things where they needed money and they're like, fine, we'll just throw this in there too because i mean it, just the fact that he cuts that poster there i mean it's one thing to kind of casually mention it's like michael j fox going into cafe 80s and back to the future 2 and going i just want a pepsi but it's another thing to like boom cut to like the pepsi you know and have him go it's the taste for a new generation you know or whatever like yeah you know. i mean i think suzuki I, I, you know it can't be that much different over there than it is here which is the idea that if you're going to make any piece of pop art to not uh, you know, include any sort of branding in some form sure. is probably an omission that makes it not as representative as it could be of, you know, because, I mean, everything, you know, these days and, and even back then, it comes down to that. And so I think, um, you know, I think it's included subtly enough. I say subtly, not necessarily as presentation, but at least in the way it's threaded, uh, not frequently uh, into this narrative to the point that you you you, you are very conscious of it because it's not like a Michael Bay movie where you kind of almost not forget, but it's so front loaded with, OK, now they're holding a Miller. Now they're at a McDonald's. <laughs> now they're where you think, OK, well, maybe you give him the benefit of the doubt, even though it's not true. But like, oh, maybe he's just trying to show this takes place in our world because those are all the things we have. And so. I, I think it's not quite done, you know, to that effect, to the point where because it's so infrequent, every time it happens, it is jarring, which means you have to consciously think about it, which is kind of the opposite of what those moments should be. It shouldn't be that you think about it. True. It, it should be that you just take it at face value. So it almost becomes a joke in, in and of itself. So if he did get any money for it, I think the joke is on uh, whoever gave him the money for it. <laughs> I would agree. And I think you're right in the sense that if it wasn't there at all, it'd be conspicuous in its absence, which is certainly true. I mean, especially, I mean, Japan and Tokyo in particular is very famous for Especially after the 1964 Olympics, it's just wall to wall advertisement and, and it's so much more now, of course. But I, I think you're right. In a way, I, I feel like 
It's a bit like the Yakuza stuff at the beginning where um, there's the black and white scenes and and Umasani is like, oh, no, at any moment he's going to explode. And then they cut to those very James Bond-esque scenes of him shooting. And it's all in garish color. Yeah. It's almost like he's like, fine, I'm going to top load the beginning with a bunch of Yakuza action. And it's going to have no meaning. But you know what? You, you wanted it. You're going to get it. And then there's not going to be any of that for a long time. So yeah. I wonder in a way if he's like, OK, you want a product placement? I'm going to go full on. He's not going to try to subtly do it like, I mean, Michael Bay, I think, attempts to subtly do it. You know, Michael Bay doesn't actually literally cut to a can of Miller. Uh, well, I mean, at least by itself, really. Most of the time. Most of the time. So this feels almost um, Brechtian, I guess, is what I would say. I, yeah. I mean, you're right in a way. We could think of it as Godardian. But the funny thing is, he didn't know Jean-Luc Godard's stuff, and Jean-Luc Godard didn't know his stuff. So it's like th th they were operating unbeknownst to each other at a, in a period of time where it's almost like they both captured the zeitgeist of their countries at that moment. It was like it was an idea whose time had come. And that was just that, you know? Oh, yeah. And they had, they did not even have access to each other's stuff. Well, yeah. Well, and not to mention, if it was truly a Godardian, it wouldn't cut to a product. It would cut to the word product or yes. it would, cut, you know, in a very they live fashion almost because I yes. feel like... Uh, that would be like the way Suzuki is doing it here would be uh, almost like too realistic <laughs> for Godard, where he wouldn't want to be mistaken for doing anything other than commenting on. True, true. Yeah, Godard wouldn't want to do it like, you know, the Who Sells Out, that cover where it shows like the one dude in like a, a bath of baked beans. I think it's Keith Moon or yeah. something. You know, you want to go like way overboard with it. And or like Repo Man. Yeah, right. That you know. Actually, that's a. That would be an interesting film to do an episode on, perhaps. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Wanted, yeah, I'd be down. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, yeah, but Godard and, like, you know, this time he's doing uh, Pierre Lafoe and um, Made in USA and two or three things I know about her, where they were, he's really pushing that. Of course, now the politics are up front, too. Uh, and, again, Godard was heavily influenced by Bertolt Brecht. I don't think Suzuki was, per se, or at least he says he wasn't. But it's even when the visuals are straightforward, because there are like you said, it's paced well. There's it isn't like every shot is like I'm out doing the last shot. But I mean, the the characters will even do things that are a little bit off. And it reminds me of some of the mechanization stuff that I read uh, Brecht would have his characters do. So, like, it feels just super unnatural to me. And I, I assume probably to everybody how little Otsuka's assassins try to hide. The fact that they're stalking Tetsu, like there's that shot where he leaves the color coordinated phone booth, you know, and within seconds, a whole gang of them just walk into the shot and they just leer at him leaving. It's like yeah. just zero attempted incognito. It's very stylized to the, to an unnatural point. And like stuff like um, in the climax, you know, Atsuka starts firing his gun as soon as Tetsu gets there. He doesn't even put down his drink or he doesn't drop it. He's he's holding and it's like the drink's like spilling over and he's like. Psh. Yeah, I feel like it's um like the same kind of madcap stuff that like richard lester did with like the beatles and 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 other you know rogers but like very hard day's night where mm -hmm. like it's almost framed for the optimal effect of a gag and i'm not saying that you know tokyo drifter is necessarily a, a comedy mm -hmm. but i think things are done with the intention to call attention to itself which is a form of comedy because it's you know that's every comedian is look at me absolutely Suzuki is definitely having a good time and he's inviting us to laugh too. It's like what uh, we were saying about um, catharsis. You know, I, th I think the catharsis of laughter where it's like, oh man, he did the exact opposite of what the genre convention there was going to be. And, you know, in spite of myself, I'm really laughing and I'm really enjoying it. And, and I think you're right. It is very like Richard Lester, like, uh, which is funny because I mean, that was 64. This is 66. I mean, this is all in, in Godard, of course, is, uh, let's see, 60, well, six, uh, 59 through basically 68. And it's like all these guys are doing this on on in different countries. I mean, I mean, I, I Lester and Godard knew each other's work, of course, but it's just fascinating to see this. You know, also I, and speaking of like unnatural things, there's another part too that I have to ask you about. What is it do you think that stops Tetsu the Viper from shooting at Tetsu in the junkyard? Is it that he's hypnotized by the process of watching a car get like cubed, like smashed into a cube? Or is he lulled into a trance by Tetsu singing? It is one of the most oddly unnatural telegraphed moments. It's it's great, but again, it, it it's 
drawing me out of the story and telling me this is artifice. And and I wonder, being somebody who just saw this recently, what was your take on that? I mean, for me, it definitely came down to the car. And maybe that's because I was also transfixed because mm. uh, Suzuki forces us to watch that instead of any actual action. Right. And um, <laughs> right. as it's with happening, the, with the theme though, song, you know, while he's singing the theme song, you know, I mean, yeah, it's, it's such a bizarre, <laughs> you know, combination. And you know? as it's happening i have a whole narrative going on in my head where i'm like oh look there's a brief glimpse of a compactor and i'm like oh okay we're gonna see uh it gets smushed a little oh okay i think we're gonna watch this whole thing <laughs> yeah and then i'm like huh you know what i'm actually kind of interested and, and entranced by like what this looks like because you know we it, it takes an everyday object you know and it pushes it into a form that we're not used to like we're never ever going to get used to what a car looks like basically <laughs> when it's been smushed because we as humans are unable to do it like we need uh, obviously uh, man-made things to do it for us mm -hmm. and b it pushes it into a state that's completely unusable therefore <laughs> its only value is an aesthetic one you know and that's why we're kind of entranced by it so i feel like you know very similarly that's kind of what suzuki is doing with uh the crime genre in general like where he's taking it and he's just mushing it down into its uh literal parts and of course we're not going to look away because it looks so unlike uh what it normally should mm. and uh you know even the villain of the movie can't uh go against that and of course he's going to get sucked into it too Oh, that's a really good point. And, and you're right. I do think the, the, that especially when you get to these last couple Suzuki films from the 60s, they do get really concentrated. I think in a way he's like you said, he is sort of cubing the genre. I don't think he hates the Yakuza genre. I just think he's bored and wanting to kind of do more with it. But it's I mean, but that scene with the with the car, it's it's odd. I mean, there's wipes. Yeah. Which would show the period of time. I mean, which means he's putting more effort into uh, presenting the sequence and, uh, you know, depiction of an action that has no bearing on the plot whatsoever than he is on scenes that are actually technically moving the plot forward. And right. yet he's cutting away from things. He's, you know, moving on or uh, panning the camera almost, uh, I wouldn't say uh, against the current, but certainly in a way to just kind of uh, zip past it to the next thing. So it, it, it truly is this almost, uh, I don't know, trickster god like <laughs> yes. director who is like yeah you know i skipped all that but uh oh isn't this nice shiny car important <laughs> and beautiful you know and uh, it is kind of funny actually that you mentioned that because yeah he does very lovingly lens this whole sequence i mean that actual sequence in real life probably would have taken about 20 to 25 minutes so i'm you're imagining tatsu the viper transfixed for this whole time, and, there, you know, you're, like I said, there's these wipes showing time's passing. Why is he spending all this time on this while he's not spending time on, well, I guess all the stuff that he has spent time on a million times before? Yeah. You're right. I mean, there's definitely a trickster element. And again, it's not like, ah, I fooled you. I don't think he's trying to, like, be a jerk. I think he's just trying to make it as entertaining as possible. And he figures, well, if I'm bored, you're probably bored, too, because you've seen a lot of these movies yeah. already. So let's watch a car get smashed. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, it's original. Yeah. I've never seen that happen in a movie. I don't think not like that. And maybe the car represents the code of honor, mm. you know, and mm -hmm. it's kind of like it was a novel invention when it was, you know, created and it certainly served its purpose. But, right. you know, maybe it's time to just uh, compact it and maybe it's time to finally just junk it completely. Well, actually, I like that analogy about as well as anything I could come up with, to be perfectly honest. That's pretty good. I, I like that. <laughs> but I, I, I do feel like. Well, okay, so there's there's Howard Hampton who writes in a fantastically ecstatic style about Suzuki. Uh, and uh, he says uh, he hit audiences with hot and cold blasts of displacement, staging banal exploitation as hallucinogenic three-penny opera. He deployed imagery and editing for sensual alienation effects, modifying cinematic syntax as casually as a rock modifies stained glass. So there's three references there to, to Brecht, basically. 
And, uh, I, you know, you'll often hear critics talk about Suzuki's uh, distancing techniques as being like Brecht. And I, I yes, I think it is. He's using Brechtian stuff, whether whether he knew it was Brechtian or not, to unmask the illusions of cinema. But he's doing it, I believe, for different reasons. And this is kind of where I would land on all these weird disruptions, like the unnatural movements of the people, like sitting there watching a car getting cubed. Or, um, which is known as cubism in the art world. It is, yes. It's cubedism, actually. Cubedism, yes. But so there's all these things. I think when, now with Brecht, the idea was that he was using what he, you know, called alienation effects or, or dis displacement effects or, you know, distancing effects, basically such as like breaking the fourth wall to address the audience, which is stuff that's so common now. But at the time, it was very disruptive and odd. It really shook people. And I think. From what I understand, he was trying to make sure the audience was not getting so swept in the illusion of, you know, theater, that they're unable to look at what's happening on stage objectively and critically, basically. He was trying to give the audience a kind of emotional uh, buffer zone from the characters. Like, yes, theater feels like life. It's There's a lot of verisimilitude here. But there's a story being told and we don't want to – you have to look at what's going on because Brecht was very much a political and moral writer. Now, I think Suzuki's not trying to distance the audience. I think he's trying to externalize, like I said before, his protagonist's, uh, quote, you know, heroic internal mindset. And they're, well, often pr probably heroic delusions, you know. And I think Suzuki's humor isn't sarcastic exactly. I think it comes from – well, from a hyperbole of style, of course, to the point that the humor, I think, merges with the pathos. Like you said, you talked about being kind of moved by Tetsu's loyalty the second time you watched it. So instead of the traditional catharsis from like we get from gen genre boxes getting ticked, we get like a catharsis of humor, which in a lot of ways is surprisingly just as satisfying, you know. But, of course, I will say this, all this theorizing and my exegesis about color and editing and Brechtian effects. And I mean, it wouldn't be honestly, it wouldn't be worth a pin's fee if if Tokyo Drifter wasn't so fun and dazzling and exhilarating to just sit back and watch. And you can turn off your brain and just watch the the visuals and and love it for that reason. You do not have to know anything about uh, the Three Penny Opera or uh you know or Godard you know to to enjoy it it's, it so it works on so many levels yeah i completely agree and i think a final note before we go to final ratings uh but yes. you know you've been talking about you know his uh possible even unbeknownst to him maybe a brechtian impulses and i, I gotta say i feel like maybe that's him mm -hmm. telling the audience you know you better brecht yourself before you wreck yourself oh good call right so yep, exactly <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna, no, that's a really good point. Thank you, thank you. Well, it's like that Warren G and Nate Dog song where he's like, "I'm brecting myself. I can't believe this happening in my hometown." Yeah. But I'm gonna cut that. That was awful. That's fine. I mean, you know, there, it reminded me of that Pixar movie mm -hmm. uh, starring John C. Riley called Breck It Ralph. Um, oh yes, know, where, yes, yes. Yeah, he's con he's constantly breaking that fourth wall. So anyway, he, actually, he is. Come to think of it, you're right. I forget that's John C. Riley. Sometimes yes, you're right. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. And, and then, so, you know, and also, of course, I'm reminded of, of the, of the uh, short films of Stan Brechtage, you know, especially his uh, famous autopsy stuff, you know, where he's breaking the fourth wall by grossing us the hell out by watching this autopsy. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's, Brecht is really everywhere. If you, if you just, if you just have the eyes for it, you can, you can see him. He's everywhere. Completely. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God, I have no idea if we're keeping any of this, but I will say this. If we do keep it and I'm sitting here saying this, it will be so meta because we'll be like, I'm cutting that. But then that's, they didn't cut it because I heard it. It's so that's, meta. Oh, man, that's true. Now we can't cut it. Uh, <sighs> Mind blown. I feel like. After you just did that final one with uh, Brackage, I mm. felt like Craig Ferguson before that Tom Selleck clip. <laughs> I I gotta watch that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, it's got everything. It's got martial arts and kung fu. It's got action, explosions. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. Of you don't know what that clip, in case yes. we do keep all of this in, uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's a great episode of craig ferguson's late late show where he's gonna have tom Selleck on, and uh they're 
he's showing a clip from the latest Tom Selleck project, which at that time was the uh, what was it, the Jesse. It's one Stone. of the Jesse Stone films. I mean, he he did I think yeah. something like in nine or ten in the end. Yeah. yeah, and so the clip is from the latest one, and it is just a clip of very sad music uh, as a you know very just depressed looking Jesse Stone and a, uh, a Labrador or Golden yeah. Retriever or whatever, but um, looks at him and he throws a stick and the dog just <laughs> continues to look at him. And like, that is it. There is no rising action. There's no dialogue no. and it's not shot very well, whatever. But when they cut no, back to... it's just painful, painful stasis for like 30 seconds. Yeah. And in well, go on, I'm sorry. No, and then so when it cuts to back to Craig Ferguson and he has to authentically well he doesn't have to but he can't not authentically react to seeing that clip especially because he's doing that right before he brings tom Selleck out he just starts cracking up because he doesn't know how to react to it he's like i gotta see that <laughs> i know and it's like it, it, well yeah. and as you pointed out one of the things that's so funny about that clip because i didn't know about it until you showed it to me and since then i've probably watched it like 10 times <laughs> but one of the things you oh it's so good but one of the things you pointed out is that it's so clear he had not watched the clip before yeah so, so like i don't know if the editing room was like we're gonna spring on him the most prosaic clip of all time yeah or, or the if, most if, banal thing we can think of seriously i mean uh, like i've watched the jesse stone films they have pacing and there's some some right. action sometimes i mean it, you know of course there is a lot of stuff with dogs but it's a robert parker product so he's always got a lot of stuff about dogs which is fine but yeah, it's just of all the clips. But the dog's show, not even doing something. Exactly. Even the dog is completely in a state of like, oh, is the camera on? Yeah, it's like the dog is in this state of torpor. Like, uh, you yeah. threw me a thing. I'm not interested, my friend. I'm angry at you about something, you know, or whatever, you know. He's like sulking. Yeah, there's just no interiority to that dog. Um, exactly. I felt like, I, you know, what I felt like was when I watched it, I was like, I'm not sure this dog is really convincing me he's a dog. This dog actor. Agreed. Is he really, I'm not sure that I'm seeing a real dog in his eyes there. You know, I'm seeing him <laughs> acting like a dog, but is he embodying the dog? You know? <laughs> oh, man. So let's move into final ratings. I right. will go ahead and say that I was a big fan of this. I was mm -hmm. expecting to like it, but I also thought there was going to be like a, a ceiling, so to speak, of like where I was going to land. But I watched it twice in the last week because I wanted to revisit it quickly just so I can kind of get my bearings with it. And my rating already kind of raised from one to the second viewing. So as of right now, as a stand, I mean, I give it four out of five stars, which I think, I mean, it's something I've only seen just this past week for the mm -hmm. first time. And so sure. it's still something that's marinating in general, but it very much stands up with the, the best of these Yakuza flicks from this time, particularly because of the way it uh, bucks conventions, both genre-wise, but also just uh, stylistically. And so I'm a big fan of uh, Tokyo Drifter, and I definitely cannot wait to uh, seek out more Suzuki films. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, kudos to you. Um, I think the first time I saw it, I did see it twice in one week, too, because there is such information and visual overload. I mean, even even though, as you say, it is paced well, it's not like just a guy shouting in your ear for an hour and a half. But it is a lot. And there's a lot of little things that pop up. You're like, oh, did I see that? Like, for instance, you know, like that hand with cigarette ash, like, was that in there? Or did I dream that last night? You know, and I, and I, I like that feeling. Um, but I've already talked too much about this movie. So I'm just going to say I give it five stars. Hell yeah. <laughs> Well, that concludes our discussion on Tokyo Drifter, directed by Seijun Suzuki. Uh, it's available now uh, out on Blu-ray uh, from Criterion Collection. So uh, mm -hmm. if you haven't seen it and uh, you want a good way to view it, that is certainly the most optimal. So let's move on to the A-list. The story, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Oh boy! So here on the A list, we like to do a segment where we take the quote-unquote B picture we just talked about and pair it with an A movie, whatever the hell that means. Uh, you know, technically, what it means to us, at least uh, 
for the purpose of this segment is to essentially pair it with a movie that most people would probably more readily watch, whether it's because of accessibility or popularity. Mm -hmm. So, it's well said. Uh, Dan, you want to go first this time? Sure. Sure. Do it. Um, uh, what rounds out your double feature with Tokyo Drifter? You know, for I was thinking about Ghost Dog, of course, the Jar Jarmusch film, which does quote a couple scenes from the next Suzuki film, Brandon to Kill, like very directly. It's very, very cool. Uh, so there was that. I thought about Kill Bill, which also quotes uh, like some of those odd lighting backdrops, like in this one. Um, and I thought about, actually, I thought about Tom Popo. You know, the Eastern yeah, film, if you yeah. will. Have you seen that, right? Yep. That was a great one. Oh, it's so good. But in the end, I, you know, I remember talking to you and Heidi about this, um, like when we were, it was like two weeks ago, I guess. And I was like, man, what do I do? It's like this film has so many weird elements. I mean, what's something that's comparable, but better known or, or more easily accessible, not just like accessible to enjoyment, but accessible, like you can actually get your hands on it. And I finally decided to go with Francois Truffaut's Shoot the Piano Player from 1960. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's his second film. Uh, he made it sort of as the antithesis to his previous years, The 400 Blows, which is a beautiful and super earnest debut that got wide acclaim. And, you know, I mean, we've talked about how, you know, it seems like the French New Wave is running somewhat parallel with Suzuki's innovations. And this is probably Truffaut's most inventive uh movie in the sense that i think Truffaut used to say what like a new idea every 30 seconds or something and he's got that in this movie it's 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 like 80 minutes jam-packed you know you've got there's a musical number uh in it where you've got the, the lyrics at the bottom of the screen but with a bouncing ball but in, instead of that the the lyrics just appear on screen as the singer performs them so it's sort of the bouncing ball effect and it's right at the beginning like it's right like 10 minutes in and you're like whoa wait what and then, you know, then it goes back to it. Just something about Shoot the Piano Player. There's just similarities I find hard to ignore, especially considering, like I said, the likelihood of their mutual ignorance of each other. And plus, there's a part in Tokyo Drifter um, in the middle when Otsuka's uh, flunkies try to get the drop on Tetsu, you know, uh, try to jackpot him, if you will. And the whole sequence is shown, like I said, in this kind of freaky elliptical way where like, we keep seeing the actions about to happen, but then we're, we're kind of, we miss it or something. And I, I felt like where there's certain crucial setup shots that are omitted, like we were saying, and it feels a little bit similar to the climax of shoot the piano player, which, you know, is complete with snow and everything. And uh, so I don't know, but then again, it could also be the fact that I had this movie on the brain because they do uh, threaten to shoot the piano player in Tokyo Drifter. <laughs> so it could be that's where the where the germ was put. Um, yeah, it, it's very much a grab bag of styles, ever changing tones. It's got slapstick film in the while. Like I said, there's a musical number. There's a romance. There's comedy. There's a bizarre fight scene that goes from being comical to suddenly deadly serious. Um, and I just, I love it. It manages to be variously um, funny. Like I said, sad, suspenseful, uh, pensive, psychologically complex, and ultimately tragic. And so naturally the critics hated it. But, you know, hey, I when, it, when a movie is able to juggle all those tones and it does it in such a artful, almost effortless way, you got to give it credit. And so for me, this is actually, if not my favorite Truffaut film, it's probably my second favorite. And um, the one I do go back to the most, I, I could, I could watch this movie probably once a year. So shoot the piano player, 1960. Right on. That is a wonderful choice. Uh, Thank you. I'm going to go a little more modern, if you don't mind. Not at all. And I'm actually going to repeat a director that I've <sighs> used before in uh, in the A-list. Not obviously somebody we've done because he's a modern director, but uh, somebody that I've used uh, his film prior um, two episodes ago, which is I'm going to talk about... 2013's The Wolverine, directed by James Mangold. Ah, you, James Mangold. Very nice. That's right. he, he does not ever get enough credit, and I always say that, and I'm sorry I'm becoming a cliche about saying that. But yes, go on. I'm a big fan of James Mangold. I definitely think he's super underrated. Obviously, that's why I've already brought him up twice, uh, both uh, in The Big Heat when I paired that with Copland and, and now with, uh, with Tokyo Drifter. And I, I'm bringing up The Wolverine because... 
Um, one, I do always want to give a shout out to this movie because people fell head over heels for Logan, the, the mm-hmm. sequel to this one, which is completely understandable because I thought that's a great movie as well. Sure. But I was already infatuated with where Mangold and Jackman uh, were taking this character from the Wolverine, uh, starting with the Wolverine. Um, in it, it is, of course, this, uh, based on the old man Logan uh, comics uh, and in the movie in which he has to go to modern day Japan to rekindle uh, a relationship with his uh, with an old shall we say, not necessarily buddy, but someone he knew back during uh, World War II. Yeah, um, yeah, somebody he's, I guess, inextricably tied to uh, because of the yes, war. Yes, yeah. because he had saved his life, basically, uh, during it. And he's his requested uh, his presence, basically, in modern day because he's, uh, you know, on his deathbed and he wants to talk with him one last time, uh, presumably to show some kind of, you know, appreciation and whatnot. And Wolverine, though, the more I started thinking about this, because I was like, well, there you have like a Western mashed with Eastern type culture class. And oh, definitely, uh, yeah. but then I'm like, you know, the the Wolverine is kind of similar to Tetsu in that he has this kind of code in the sense that while um, certainly he has uh, some anger issues, essentially <laughs> he doesn't want to fight anybody. In fact, throughout most of the Wolverine, he's actively trying not to, you know, mm-hmm. like he's very quick to turn to violence, but it's always at the, you know, at the behest of him saying, please don't do this, you know, like, please just be a decent person and I won't have to do this because I will do this very quickly and very uh uh, expediently and it will not end well for you and whatnot and (laughs) so i feel like there's that similar kind of code uh that you know both characters follow Um, both characters have this kind of almost ethereal like quality when it comes to uh seemingly like immortality i mean you know tetsu you know certainly essentially is able to drift through every situation unscathed for the most part i mean yeah he you know, the only time he actually takes real damage is when he allows it, which is in the opening, you know, act where, and that's the only time we see him put like a tiny bandage uh, <laughs> over his forehead and whatnot. Yes, that's right. And so I feel like the Wolverine's obvious immortality, as far as how he's able to heal himself and whatnot, kind of makes him a very similar drifter because he's seen. Uh, a lot of different eras and he's seen a lot of different places and he never unfortunately gets to get tied down anywhere because of the fact that he will uh, either outlive his partner or typically end up pushing them away due to his, uh, you know, to a- anger. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I, I honestly think besides the connection, I, I would just recommend the Wolverine in general. I think it's a great film. I mean, Logan is probably slightly more accomplished just in the, in the way that it really built off of what the Wolverine did. But if I'm going to rewatch one, honestly, it's usually the Wolverine. And part of that comes down to its um, colors, uh, much actually like Tokyo Drifter, there is an emphasis on primary colors, uh, particularly in the lighting of a lot of these uh, residences that uh, Logan wanders through and whatnot. And and um, and also, uh, you know, there's some there's some good action and it's very stylistic at times. So. Yeah, I'm going to recommend. And there's it. snow. There is. Yes, it is one of the few times when the eastern uh, hemisphere is actually shown to have snow. Not because they don't have snow, but because for some weird reason, uh, it's just almost always omitted. But it's shown in this movie, much like in Tokyo Drifter, where it's like regional, you know, yeah. where it's like he's, you know, in, in this metropolitan area, you know, there's no snow. But for the climax, you know, we need the snow. And now he's in the mountain ranges, you know, and whatnot. And. And so, yes, that is another uh, thing. And um, and also as a side note, I would totally recommend if anyone hasn't seen it to watch the director's cut because mm. there's a good 30 minutes or so added to it. And it's one of those things where if you are not sold on the film, it doesn't – it's not like Dr. Sleep where, in my opinion, the director's cut actually fixed the movie because um, I liked Dr. Sleep a bit but certainly thought it was with a lot of caveats whatnot where i actually think the director's cut pretty much made it uh into a fully fledged movie that it should have Mm. been from the start this is more of a case where if you like 
the Wolverine even a bit, I think it benefits from the more languid pacing that the 30 minutes extra adds, because I think that's what it was trying to do in its, you know, uh, original or I should say theatrical form, uh, but had to rush through certain things. So it felt rushed. Whereas here in the director's cut, there are some more quieter moments that I think land just as powerfully as they were allowed to in something like Logan, uh, but was quite dismissed by critics and whatnot and even if it has a bad third act like a lot of superhero movies do but um yeah they struggle they do and this is definitely the wolverine does not have anything on logan in that department because the wolverine has a very like once the last 20 minutes or so and it says a lot that none of that's changed in the director's cut you know because all that's fine you know to to feed to the masses but uh, aside from that it it, it just fleshes out a lot of great stuff so uh yeah i'm gonna go with the wolverine uh by james mangold uh, from 2013 that's a great great choice and i haven't seen that in so long and i have not seen the director's cut so i will definitely do that and i i should also uh say two things one is um uh, one thing I always find very poignant about Wolverine is the fact that when the uh, the adamantian claws come out, it hurts. And yeah. like in uh, the second X Men, he says, "Does it hurt?" He's like, "Every time." And so he's he is hesitant to fight. I mean, there's a physical yeah. manifestation of his hesitance, and it's very poignant. I think, um, yeah. and it's also a form of self flagellation. I think for him, where yeah. I do think part of him, the longer he lives, the more he thinks he deserves that. You know, so I think. Think, yeah. You know, that's the reason why it does come out so easily, so to speak. I mean, A, it's part of his powers because he's able to heal himself. But B, I feel like at a, at a, it, it becomes the, the suffering that comes with it becomes second nature to him because that's essentially what he believes is his cross to bear. Yeah, I agree. He does sort of feel like, like you said, as he goes on, he does seem to think of himself more and more like a flagellant, you know, which is sad, of course, but it does make his story poignant uh, in, in another way, too. Uh, but the other thing I was going to say is I'd forgotten that uh, Seijin Suzuki uh, said in Tokyo Drifter that Snow is the protagonist. So just to <laughs> give you another example of, no. of his yeah, uh, witty. Snow, who's in that one scene. <laughs> yeah, but apparently, I mean, there's it's very funny. He'll talk about it. He's like, yes, I'm, I'm watching the cinematographer and the production designer and they're arguing. They're both very smart, but they're both egotists. And I'm just sitting there quietly watching the snow because the snow is what we're going to use in this scene. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's just a really wonderful little uh, paragraph uh, in his, you know, memoirs or whatever you want to say. But yeah, uh, and it also just shows you Suzuki's, uh, I don't want to say his unreliability, but the fact that he does say a lot of stuff where you almost go, well, that's a little bit of great assault. But I like the idea that he's like, well, snow really is the protagonist in this film. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, and I think it says a lot, shall we say, about his editing tendencies, which is like whatever thought is foremost in his mind at any given moment while the footage is up, you know, it ends up being what dictates uh, the nature of, of what we're going to see at that moment. So, Right, right. Uh, although, unlike Michael Bay, I would say he's not like fixated on any shiny object. He he does have an overall plan, you know. No, no, no. But uh, so, which maybe no, is, for sure. Maybe that's part of what makes. I'm mean, I'm sure it's part of what makes him such a great filmmaker. So absolutely. So mm -hmm. I think that's going to about wrap it up for us today on Project Exploitation. It was a great discussion concerning Seijun Suzuki's Tokyo Drifter, and of course, our two picks for the A list being. Shoot the Piano Player, and The Wolverine. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think coming up at you next time, we may be tackling a exploitation picture. Yes, yes. And uh, if I can say what it is. Yes, I just got it in the mail. I'm really excited. Yeah, as am I, because I'm a big fan of that movie. And I think you're actually going to, I mean, not that you wouldn't, but I definitely think you will like this one for sure. So nice. we will, uh, of course, uh, announce that. Well, when that episode drops, because uh, <laughs> we, you know, you never know when schedules change and whatnot. So, True that. Uh, but look out for that. So, yeah, um, from myself, Nick Cheney, and the American drifter, Dan Jeremy Brooks, yeah. have a wonderful night and, uh, yeah, keep it real.
just needs an end, Max. I... I don't have an end.